Hello, and welcome to the Dad and Sons Podcast. I'm Matt Visual here. Uh, it's so weird to say my name like that. We have Liam. Hello. One of our lovely co host and another co host, uh, definitely a dad, George. There's there's three of us, three co hosts. I, 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 who who's the co host? Who's the regular co host? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you decide. No, you no. decide. decide. <laughs> We're having a vote off. <laughs> <laughs> So how's everyone's week been? Uh, any um, floods Oh happening? boy, I tell you, it's been real hard. Re- <laughs> oh, it's been so bad for me. I was like moving from one bedroom to another. I had to tear down a bookcase. Oh, it was uh, sweaty. It was it was intense. Mm. <laughs> so, so tiring, so exhausting. Mm-hmm. How, how about you guys? Le- Liam? I really want to hear what Liam has gone through What you been week? up to, Liam? <laughs> How was your week in comparison? Uh, Let's say my, well, starting from last Friday, my week was uh, very wet. (laughs) Wait, did a a game make you wet? Uh, No. Why why have you been so wet lately, Liam? Is it excitement? Uh, Well, I don't know. Maybe I was playing this kind of cool indie game called, what the fuck was it called? It was called... Ultra Space Battle Brawl. Um, that would make I, me I wet. Could... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wait, right? dude, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's got like baseball and pong and arcanoid all mixed together in this weird <laughs> ass did, battle did, pong did game. Did you just say bong, pong? Yeah. In in in, they're like mixing pong into genres now, dude. Like this, this game. I, I mean, it was a part of the story, and I'll get, I'll get, I'll explain more about it in a, in a minute. But going back to uh, the the being wet, unfortunately, it wasn't because of excitement. It was, uh, it was maybe because uh, the area of Japan I live in. People might have heard about this. Uh, the area I Jap- uh, I live in Japan decided um, that it would have the most rain it's ever had in its history of recorded history it's the highest amount of rain uh-huh. in a concentrated period of time in uh in the history of japan almost uh, <laughs> so uh i don't know if you, you know guys but when rain falls a lot <laughs> rivers rivers tend to get bigger and that causes something called flooding and basically, half of the city I am currently in this very instant is underwater. Quite literally, underwater. The city that you're in this instant, now inquiring listeners want to know, is that your home where you live? Yes. So where I oh, live... Oh, you're back. A, a city... Yes. So, so I live in a city called Okayama, which is about two and a bit hours away from Osaka in Western Japan. And the prefectures, which is like your states, uh, and in England, like counties, uh, the prefectures of Hiroshima, Okayama, Totori, eh, Ehime, Kagawa, uh, Hyogo, which were all very, very sort of Western Japan close together, just got absolutely annihilated with rain. Uh, starting like with maybe like some quite heavy rain Wednesday, Thursday, leading up to Friday where it was relentless. I grew up in the UK and, you know, the, the joke is that it always rains in the UK. And, Very you know, gray. it kind of does, you know, it's gray and it rains, but the rain, you know, always stops. It has periodic breaks where it's like, I'm tired. I'm just going to quit for a bit. And, you know, we'll let the clouds just hover over you, making you depressed at how great they are. And then we'll continue. Whereas this rain in Japan was like someone just left the shower on for like 60 hours. Just, God. it was so heavy and it, I'd never seen anything like it. Like in the whole history of living in the UK and being in Japan, I've never seen anything like it. It's rainy season in Japan. It usually rains quite heavily because of the humidity and sort of the tropical, you know, climate. 
Um, but this was just madness. And because of that, uh, I live in an area where there are lots of rivers. We have these rivers. And then up in the mountains, the, you know, the towns are very low in the bottom of the mountains. So rivers up in the mountains just overflowed and flooded the towns in the mountains. Oof. And so Friday night was when it sort of all kicked off. And to preface this, Okay, I know the city I live in, well, the prefecture is supposedly the safest prefecture in all of Japan for natural disasters. Like, when we get earthquakes, it's very minimal earthquakes. We have the big island of Shikoku in front of us, so we don't get tsunamis. And then usually we don't get any sort of natural disasters compared to, you know, Tokyo or, uh, you know, we had the big earthquake in Osaka not like three weeks ago. Um, so usually everyone's like, ah, oh, okay, I'm a safe as houses, you know, but those houses are now underwater. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and this is with all due respect and seriousness, like this has been a really, really big deal, like yeah, emergency so, story. People yeah, have, yeah, have uh, yeah. not made it out. Yeah. So, you know, we're sort of laughing about it because, you know, in hindsight, you have to sort of laugh at these things, but as I'll sort of get into now is kicking off on Friday, you know, it's, you know, when we're recording this for me, it's Friday tomorrow. It's a week since, but nearly 200 people have died and 70 Whoa. plus people are missing in my prefecture. It went from 50 to 200. Yeah. Yeah. Nearly 200 people are, are, are recorded dead now. And in Japan, they don't record deaths until they know. So that is 200 people thus far we know for sure have died. And and the 70 others are just question mark. Yeah. And across the prefectures, there have been 8 million people evacuated. That's like the size of a small country <laughs> like has been and evacuated. C- correct me if I'm wrong, but you were um, among them for a while. Yes. I, I thought. Yeah. And, so, yeah, yeah. So what happened is in Japan... We have these emergency alarms. I don't know if you have them in America. Like if you like, for example, you know, like California has earthquakes and stuff. Do you, do you get like text alerts when are you supposed to get like text alerts when like a natural disaster or something is happening? I think you're supposed to. I, I get okay. flood alerts on my text sometimes. Okay, yeah. So in Japan, that happens quite frequently because obviously natural disasters happen in Japan like fucking every day, uh, whether it's a small earthquake or, you know, a typhoon or something. Uh, and most of the time, you know, I, I actually tweeted about this a couple of weeks ago about wanting to make a game based around receiving these text messages and panicking because <laughs> they are they are complex kanji. They are kanji to do with natural disasters and they are written in very honorific and keigo Japanese. So they are very professional, very difficult to read. And they are so hard to take in because when you get them, panic overwhelms you because you only get them if it's you know, kind of serious, like something is happening, Uh, you know, whether it's you're expecting an earthquake in the next few seconds or like a typhoon is happening or a tsunami. Like when your phone alarm goes off and everyone's goes off at the same time. So if you're in a public place, it's fucking horrifying. You just have all these alarms going off. Uh, Being foreign, you pull them out and you look at it and you're like, I don't even know what the fuck is happening. I I can't read this. So like panic overwhelms you because it could be either the biggest earthquake Japan is about to experience ever and you you just don't know it and you're waiting or it could be like a minor thing where like an area near you needs to you know be precautious about something that's happening or gonna happen so Mm -hmm. they are quite scary as a foreigner to get because Unless you are, you know, fluent, completely fluent in Japanese, and I can, you know, read some kanji, I can scan it for, like, jishin, which is earthquake, and I didn't know what the kanji for flood was until, you know, this week. So you look at it, and you're like, fuck, what do I do? Oh, what is what is happening? And I feel like that's an important distinction to make. Like, you've been studying Japanese for all these years, yeah. but there is a specific symbol for flood. Yes. One word of hundreds yeah. of thousands, I'm guessing, total. you don't total. know it, you you're don't know. You're supposed to, like, know 2,000 of these by the time you're you're out of high school, right? Yeah, but even if you know it, you don't know the severity of 
what is happening, right? You could be like, flood, and you'd be like, oh, like, God. Like, you should know how to read this stuff, and, and yeah. the emergency text messages are apparently too complicated. Oh, God, it's horrifying. Whoa, it's I did so not scary. Know that. <laughs> That's a weird problem to think about as, yeah, as an English you know, speaker. It's, it's not, like, if you got a text message on your phone that said, 6.5 magnitude earthquake, you'd be like, fuck, I'm yeah, getting under my desk. They, they'd also, like, make sure it could be read. Like, they would make sure it would be as, like, dry and simple as possible. Yeah, and we don't get English language versions. You have to, you know, Whoa. Google them if if they, someone translates it fast enough. Um, I think you probably sign up for some, but I've never found them. So what happens is, and it happens every time, is if you're in a public place or you're at work or whatever, you basically look at your Japanese friends or co-workers for panic. <laughs> and like if they're panicking then that means it might be a good idea for you to panic yeah because japanese people you know they're used to this bullshit they're used to mother nature battering them like <laughs> oh my god like constantly right so they don't panic very often even if it's usually it's very like stunned silence and while they listen to the alarm or they read the message and then they decide like so there's like a few like 20 seconds or so where you're looking at them and you're waiting for them to like move or decide and then if they carry on with what they're doing you're like oh, oh, oh it's fine it's fine okay it's okay it's fine right but then if like they're like shit get under your desks then that's when you start panicking um but Friday night was a little different because I was at home on my own and I live in Okayama City uh, and, you know, I know a couple of people who live in the city and stuff like that, but they, you know, it's not close proximity to anyone. So I kind of live here on my own and is, there's not really anyone I could just like quickly like go to their house and like find out what was happening. So, you know, I got home and... and I noticed the rain is like rising and it's continuing. And then all of a sudden, like from about 7 p.m. onwards, we start getting alerts like every hour, like every, I don't know, even like half an hour. It was just alert after alert after alert after alert. And it was different area, like different wards. Like Japan is like each city is split into like north, south, east, you know, uh, west wards of the city mm -hmm. and it's just like if you live near this river evacuate now if you live here we need to evacuate the elderly now because it's slower and we need to take precaution and it was just like every 30 minutes to an hour just alarm after alarm after alarm after alarm and you're just panicking constantly because you're watching this unfold and like god like absolutely bless my poor girlfriend who is maybe who lives about you know, an hour and a half away from me, Hyogo, which was hit quite badly, but not as badly as the areas I live in. You know, she's super worried about me being in Okayama, and I keep sending her these alarm messages like, please, please, Ran, translate this one. <laughs> Am I going to die? Like, what's going to happen? <laughs> Do I need to evacuate? Like, you know, and she's like trying to translate it as quickly as possible to like tell me what to do and stuff like that. And every... 30 minutes or so i'm just like ron what do i do like do i need to like go buy some water do i need to put like an emergency backpack together because like if you evacuate you have to like you don't know how long you're going to be gone for right like in worst case scenario like kurashki which is a it's, it's like a, a part of okayama city about 20 kilometers away from me like not far at all like a 20 minute drive it's like completely submerged and destroyed like it was underwater like, if you Google pictures for Kurashiki, Okayama, flood, you will be amazed. It's just, it's it's essentially like the whole town is a river now. Like, so the people who evacuated, they're going to go to homes that are just destroyed. So, like, you have these backpacks, these emergency backpacks, just in case, like, you ain't coming back. Like, your house is not going to be here. Or your apartment is going to be destroyed or whatever. Like, so you have, like... You know, mobile phone chargers, torches, like cup ramens, uh, lots of bottles of water, battery packs. So in packs. your panic, what did you bring from your house? So I bought like, I, I went to the store quickly and, you know. Also cup ramen? Yeah, because like a lot of people have like hot water canisters and stuff like that. And it's like cheap, easy. Uh, easy uh, meals. Easy Last meals that don't, it, that don't like go out of date and stuff like yeah. that, right? If it works for Big Boss. Exactly. You know, so I went and I, I bought like a couple of cup ramens and I bought like uh, three bottles of 
water and i i had like my backpack with a battery charger in there and stuff like that no come on, and, come um, on. I, I mean what did you bring from your house I'm not talking oh, about all so, this. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. So uh, you know the night is going on and mm-hmm. it's getting worse, and I'm hearing you know from friends and other people like I'm looking on Twitter as well, and like I'm just seeing pictures. And bearing in mind it's really dark, you know, it's, it's nighttime, so people can't really ju- like you can't take pictures of rivers in the dark. Like it doesn't show you this the full scale of what is happening until you see it in broad daylight, like the next day when we saw like the pictures of Kraski. Like, you kind of just, like, completely, like, what is happening? Like, I have no fucking idea what is happening, you know? And I'm just getting these pictures, and I'm, I, and I'm like, my God, like, the whole city, it's like the apocalypse. It's, like, literally the apocalypse. Like, just in different areas uh, where I, I go, like, or bars I go to, or, like, restaurants I know, or, like, places I've been, just all of a sudden are, like, 10 feet underwater. Like... There are two meters of water everywhere and just stuff is flooding in and friends are being evacuated. They're going to like the local schools because they have to get away from their apartments. And all while this is happening, I'm thinking my apartment is on the bottom, is on the ground floor. And I'm literally 500 meters away from a river. And I can't, I like, I can't stress this enough, right? The river I live near is very small and there is like a three meter, like, slope towards the road where you walk down some steps to go down to like some tennis courts and basketball courts which are riverside this river is super wide so it, it, usually this river like let's say it's like 20 feet down from the top of the road like if you if you're looking down it's about 20 feet I didn't think about it, but then I was like, shit, I wonder what the state of that river is. Like, am I, like, going to have to evacuate because of the Shakengawa, the river next to me? And I'm like, like, if that breaks the bank, that's just going to, like, go down the hill and just flood my apartment. Like, I am the one of the first people who's going to suffer from that river. So I, like, I'm like, okay, let's go check. You know, I go outside in the absolutely belting rain to this river, and I look, and I'm like, holy fucking shit this basic ravine like this tiny river was like an ocean it was an ocean i've never ever seen anything like it like it had grown wide by at least 50 meters like it had just swallowed whole this whole area the tennis courts and basketball courts were completely underwater. And the bridge that goes over the top of it, usually there's a gap of, you know, about three or four meters in height. Like, the water was overlapping over the bridge, like, splashing onto the road. Like, it was, it was like someone had just, like, photoshopped a river, like, into (laughs) this place. And I'm, like, panicking as fuck right now. Because I'm like, it's only 8 p.m., and if this carries on all night like it's supposed to, that river is going to just, like, burst through. And I don't know what I'm going to do. So then luckily these, like, uh, these firemen pass and they're, like, they're basically observing the height of the river and they're notifying any what the changes are and the, the rate and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I'm speaking to them in Japanese and I'm trying to talk to them and I have my girlfriend on the phone and she speaks to them as well. And they're basically saying, you know, don't worry now, don't panic, it's, it's, it's more dangerous for you to be outside. Uh, just basically keep checking the alarms to evacuate. But, like, this river um, is really wide. So... Like, fingers crossed, it will not go over the top. And I'm like, dudes, can you see it? It's like, it's like literally half a meter from going over the top. Like, at this rate, we're going to all drown in this river. And they're like, no, no, don't worry about it. You know, we've done the calculations. It should be fine. I'm like, fuck, I, I hope you guys are right. Um, and then I go back and then, like, there's this, like, ditch near my house where, like, the water passes through for the rice fields. And I'm, I come back and I notice that's just, like, overflowing as well. And that's pouring into the car park of my apartment block. And then I'm, like, looking in the dark because I didn't notice. You know, I'm splashing in water thinking I'm just walking through the rain. But actually, my, like, my feet are in, like, water up to, like, halfway up my leg. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, fuck. 
let alone that river bursting. Like, this ditch is going to flood my apartment as well. What is going on? This is just madness. Like, there is so much water. And at this point, I'm thinking, I have to leave. I have to evacuate. I I honestly don't yeah, want to leave it too late. Place. Like, I don't, I don't want to leave it too late. Like, by the time the evacuation call happens, like, I just don't want to be in a position where it's impossible for me to leave you know so, or i have to get on the roof or something so you don't know if your house is going to be there okay so yeah so what are you bringing with you <laughs> okay so this is what happened so my idea then my bright idea was to drive while it was like at the peak of its like rain like i didn't want all of the rain to fall and just the roads to become completely impassable I, I was like, right, I'm going to drive the hour and a half to my girlfriend's in Hyogo because it's it's not that bad over there. Like, it's pretty bad, but it's, like, not end of the world bad like it is here. And I'm like, okay, I need to basically pack everything that I want to take with me that's safe. So I took my hard drive. Okay. <laughs> I, took my, <laughs> I took my laptop because the hard drive, oh, okay. I, so I, the literally, yeah. I literally just did a backup the other day of like my new game that I'm working on. And like, if I'd lost that hard drive, I would be just, I would be mm. in hell. I'd be so upset. So I took my laptop. I just like the, the order you list them in, you put the hard drive before the laptop. The laptop yeah. So. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause my laptop's breaking anyway. So it's like, well, the hard drive has everything on it, whereas the laptop is like, you know, the laptop's fallen to pieces. So, so I got the laptop, the hard drive. I took my switch. Um, uh, what else did I take? Uh, I took like phone charges and stuff. Uh, what? I think that was it. Like, I, I tried to, I, I basically tried to carry light. But what I did do is then I put, because my, my bed is like on, is quite high up like it's on top of like a cupboard like there's a cupboard underneath my bed like in my apartment and i i just started putting everything on top of it because it's about four foot off the ground so i was like well if this place is gonna flood i'm gonna at least try and put all of my electronics like on top of it so if oh. even if there's like two feet of water like it, they should still be okay they, they got five feet of shelf yeah <laughs> so i basically i'm just like putting this shit on top and like Thanks to George. George bought me uh, a, a, like a birthday present. He bought me like a, an electronic fan for my desk to and stop me flooded. from <laughs> no to stop me from over overheating in the summer. And I was like, I can't, I can't let George down. I, 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 I was like, I was unplugging his, I was unplugging his so fan that he bought he me. The fan. Yeah, so I put the fan, the fan, the fan in my yes. car. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to take this new high-tech fan that George bought me and I'm going to take it with me like a baby. I'm going to strap it into the back. So I start driving. Priorities. I start driving to, like, I drive maybe 10 minutes down my road and I have to stop because it's too dangerous. You know that scene in Jurassic Park where Dennis is trying to leave the island and it's just absolutely pissing it down with rain and then he gets spat on by those tiny little dinosaurs. I hated that scene. Uh -uh. It was the scariest yeah. part of the movie. It's horrible, right? And he can't see through his glasses because it's pissing it down. And, like, yeah. he just can't see anything, right? That's what it was like. Newman, no. <laughs> that was what it was like, minus the dinosaurs, unfortunately. Minus the dinosaurs. That is exactly what it was like. It was just, like, impossible to see. Like, you're driving through darkness, but there's water everywhere. So all of a sudden, like, you lose grip on your steering and you could feel it in your tires. And I'm like, I am literally 10 minutes down the road. I can't drive for two hours in this. It's impossible. Like, I would probably die or get in an accident. So I had to turn around and go back to my apartment. And by this point, the water had risen more. And I, I was looking at the river and the river looked like it had got higher. And I'm like... One of these motherfuckers is going to take me. If this river is going to take me or I'm going to drive and I'm going to crash. Like, so, so like the, today is not my day. So, unfortunately, I can't do anything about it. And there's nowhere for me to go. So, I'm just like, well, I have to go back to my apartment and wait it out. So, then I'm like, well, I might as well just play the switch on my couch and ignore everything. Oh, my <laughs> God. You played video games? Yeah, so. In I, a natural I would, disaster? So, I sat. I pulled my couch down. I didn't bother hooking everything oh i didn't want to God. i didn't want to put all the plugs back in so i put it, so i just sat on the couch that, that's like some weird black mirror gag 
I know, but it's like all you can do. Like you're you, like at the back of your mind, you're I, like, I, I guess just I to... just never thought of it that way before. And that's the thing about the switch is like another great thing about it. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to plug, I didn't want to plug all the electronics back in in case of like water damage. So it was so, just like I'll just play the switch on my couch and just you know if I have charged? to leave. Yeah, it, thankfully it was. I'm just charged. like imagining a. A Nintendo, like, <laughs> PSA commercial. Like, I'm imagining sitting down on the couch in in fall of 2005, flipping on the news to, to see Kanye West, like, scream about how George Bush doesn't care about black people in the middle of the levees breaking and the <laughs> Katrina hurricane flooding New Orleans and everyone having to evacuate. And seeing this, like, Nintendo PSA, where it's like, together... We're helping rebuild the nation. As the camera swoops across crowds of refugees playing their switches, we're keeping America entertained in this time of crisis. No. Oh, man. No. So, essentially, I'm sat there on my couch playing Ultra Space Battle Brawl, this, <laughs> this baseball-like Arkanoid Pong clone. And you're already wet. Um, <laughs> And, oh you know, like, my... This is terrible. This is terrible. You know, my, terrible. Clothes, my clothes are wet. I'm soaked through the rain. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to change my clothes in case I have to, like, hightail it out of there and get wet again. And I'm just playing the Switch. I, I'm literally, like, my, my phone alarm keeps going off. Like, it's like, evacuate the north ward of Okayama City. Evacuate the east ward of Okayama City. Seriously, if you live near this fucking river, evacuate right now. And it's just all these alarms go off. And then... I kid you not, I'm playing this game that's all about, like, smashing a baseball across a screen, like, in space, causing super damage. I hear this explosion. Okay. I hear, I hear an explosion. An right? explosion. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, no, an explosion, okay? Oh, yeah. I, so, I'm like, what is happening? Did I just dream that? Is that part of the game audio or whatever? I'm pretty sure that was an explosion. And I thought, because usually that sound is usually like an earthquake sound, like very sharp and quick. Like, I'm like, oh no, is an earthquake happening at the same time as this flood? That would be so typical of Japan to have an earthquake and a flood at the same time. But it, 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 it like nothing happens and it passes. And I'm like, it must have just been like the game or, or like something must have just popped outside. But it, you know, I've never heard a bomb in my life or I've never heard like a gunshot or anything like near me. Oh. You know, I've seen videos or and heard the sound and I was like, I'm pretty sure that's like a, a, like a bomb sound, like an explosion. You know, and, I, and like time passes and I'm trying to play the game because I'm trying to just like, you know, if I'm 100% honest, I'm freaked out. Like, I'm like, this is, you know, you know, 200 people have died, like, we know now. Like, this is super serious. People are evacuating across the city. Eight million people evacuated. This is... And you're this playing is video this, games. And I'm playing video games, but I don't know what to do. I'm messaging Ron. I'm messaging my girlfriend, like, what do I do? And she's like, you have to just, you know, it, um, unless it says evacuate and tells you where to go, like, you, there's nothing you can do. And I'm like, well, what else can I do apart from sit here and, and, you know, keep checking my phone? I might as well just try. Can and you canoe to the other city? To well, evacuate? that's what happened. In Kureshki, they had to get Wait, canoes what? and boats to get old Wait, people you, off. Was I right? <laughs> no. So that didn't happen to me, but oh. it happened like 10 minutes from here. Like, old oh people God. were stuck on their roof. Yeah, I guess. Like, what? How There's else a picture, would they get out? This, this is how bad it was. There's a picture of a horse on a roof in Karashki because the water rose so high, the horse broke out of its pen and swam on top of a roof wow. and was found on top of the roof of a house. It was so bad. But I'm trying to play this game, and I'm like, that was definitely an explosion. And then I check my phone, and then everyone is messaging about the sound, and I'm like. So I wasn't the only one who heard that. So then that must have been something. And then, you know, slowly people are trying to find out information. And then everyone finds out that maybe, I don't know, 20 or so kilometers away, maybe 30 kilometers from where I live in a place called Soja, like a very small town, a like aluminum, aluminum, whatever you want to say, aluminum factory had exploded. So, so like the, the city the, flooded... 
one so, thing leads to another. It, it gets yeah, so, complicated. A, a so series of floods, events and then happen, and an aluminum factory explodes. Explodes. So the wow. what must have happened is the flooding had caused like electrical damage or an electrical surge. Th- this was nobody's day. It was nobody's day. But I've seen videos of the explosion, and holy Jesus Christ! No one died thanks to the explosion. But I've never seen anything like Wait, it. Wait, thanks to the explosion? Like, you know, no one died because of the explosion. People have died because of the flood, but not the actual explosion itself. Like, no one died because of that. But I've seen the video of the explosion, and it's... I have no idea how anyone in that area survived. It's so big. Just like, it has like... You know when... Not like a nuclear bomb, but you know when a bomb goes off and it has the initial explosion and the white flash? And then it has like a second explosion where everything, like the whole sky just goes like bright white and just like there's like the aftershock of it. Whatever chemicals were in that factory had caused this huge explosion that within a hundred kilometer radius of Okayama, people heard that explosion. Oh, I have some some bad news. I've been Googling it while you're talking about it. Yeah. One one of the headlines that comes up is Japan Time. One dead, a dozen injured in Fukui chemical plant explosion on July 3rd. Is that the one? Yes. Oof. I think so. Yeah. So Asahi Aluminum Industry. Hey, can you can you see the video? I can't find the video. So uh, actually, I'm gonna. I, I have. I have this. I found a. Re- I found a Reddit like thread about it. Like there's a dash cam. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh yeah. So that is like the aftermath explosion. Like you can see, and it like the pictures like of the like combinis and like the houses. Just all the windows are smashed in from the like aftershock, and uh, the shockwave was so large that people heard oh. it. A hundred kilometers away. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah. So we have all this flooding and we have explosions going off. And I'm just like, dude, I'm just going to, I'm going to truly sticking to my brand. I'm going to die playing video games. Like, <laughs> this is it. This is what's going to happen. So what's up, fellow gamers? <laughs> what's up, fellow gamers in heaven? What's happening? <laughs> It's How did boy. you pass? How did you pass? I was playing the Switch on my couch as the water levels rose and rose. <laughs> Where you're just but, like holding onto the ceiling with with the Switch in one hand and yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, to to essentially, you know, I I think I've gone on too long about this, but to essentially cap it off, uh, you know, we had all this water and explosions and. I, I couldn't sleep. It was so mentally stressful. You just, you know, it, the, the one thing I can say about earthquakes is, yeah, they're horrible and devastating, but at least they happen so very quickly that they're over and you can get on with your life if you're still alive, right? Whereas with the flood, it was just like nine to ten hours of nonstop alarms and evacuation notices and... It was like, you know, when you watch disaster movies and they unfold over a matter of hours and it always is like at 930 and it's like we had an explosion at the soldier aluminium factory. And it was like that constantly. You're just getting updates from people who live in the city and like they're like, we're evacuating here. Like you need to get out if you're near this river or uh, we've heard that this combini is completely underwater and people are trapped inside. And you're just hearing all of these mad stories that you're like, is this a fucking movie? Like what is what is going on? Uh, about 5 a.m. ish, like it's starting to get a bit brighter. And, you know, the light sort of gives you the 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 safety of seeing like what is in front of you and you can see how much the water was and it was I, i've never seen anything like it it's just water everywhere like so much is flooded and my area is like there's just all the rice fields are completely like ponds they're full of water completely the roads just have huge huge overflowing of puddles and uh just uh, so many roads had become like rivers and had to be closed um, but because it's bright, I, uh, attempt to drive and I started driving to the rain had like slowed down a bit. So it wasn't too bad, but I tried to drive to my girlfriend's again in the, in the light instead of the dark this time. And, um, 
a, a drive that usually takes me about an hour and a half took me four and a half hours. Yeah. Four and a half hours because so many of the roads were closed. So much, so many of the towns I usually go through were completely underwater. So I had to bypass them. I couldn't go into the mountains. I had to go closer towards the sea because, you know, the port towns and stuff were fine because the water just filtered into the sea. And so you ended up doing it, doing the drive. Yeah. So I did the drive um, oh. and I drove all the way there. And then just the whole day while I was still in Hyogo, like, I'm still getting messages about Okayama and evacuations. And then there is an evacuation call for Higashi Okayama, which is where I live. Like, they're like, if you live in Higashi Okayama, we need you to leave now because the Shakengawa with the river next to me is like in a burst. Thankfully, it didn't burst. I found out later. So when I returned on Sunday night, I had to return. My apartment was not flooded. No way. Yes, my apartment was safe. It was good. Yeah. I survived. But we had power outages for days, so this podcast is being recorded two days later. <laughs> wow. But I survived. Floods can't kill me. Yet. But oh, geez, do, you that's... Know what, do you know what, guys? I want to thank video games. <laughs> oh that's, that's a better track record than my hurricane relatives. Yeah. Like, I, I will be honest, like, it was so stressful that, and there, there is nothing I could do, I, and, you know, it's cliche to say, but video games, like, playing Super, what is it called? I keep forgetting his name. Ultra Space Battle Brawl. <laughs> this, you know, it's a game that's, it, it's, an, it's an intense game that requires reactions and requires you to, you know, hurry up. Oh my god, has Dr. Driller returned? Yeah. I think Mr. Driller's back. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. I did hear that. I was like, oh, is someone playing a game? Anyways, anyways, game? please, please continue. <laughs> oh, okay. Basically, this, this, this fast, intense baseball pong arcanoid like competitive game distracted me from the apocalypse with which was unfolding around me. And I'm kind of thankful for that because it was mentally taxing. And, you know, for some people, unfortunately, not 10 minutes or 15 minutes by car from me, you know, their lives are like irreversibly changed. They've lost their house. They've lost cars. They've lost animals. They've lost family members. Like it was, it was insane. Like I, I cannot, I do not want to experience anything like it again. And you know, even in moments like that, being distracted and sort of like trying to focus on something else was kind of nice and was helping. So video games do some good sometimes, uh, even in it's crazy, cliche situations. Even though video games are bad. Yeah, you Not know, gamers, you. They're, they're bad. Ga gaming disorder is... Uh... What I mean, to be fair, like if I was games. if I was high on heroin, that would have been distracting as well, and also bad for my health. So, <laughs> you know, it swings both ways, really. So, thank um, you, hypothetical heroin. Yeah, thank you, video game heroin. But yeah, that wow. was my week, Matt. Distract me with with how much you liked Octopath Traveler's demo. Oh, oh, um. Do I have to be nice to you because you've went through a tragedy? <laughs> no. Okay, Do you good. not like it? Because Octopath Traveler did... Uh. <laughs> it, okay, like, so the game looks great. And I thought it was... I don't think it's bad. I just think it's kind of... Just like the writing and the story was kind of just... Mediocre type of thing. Like, it so follows a formula demo, yeah. for each character... Yeah, the formula. It's the just formula is so real. Boring. Yeah, like, like <laughs> And then when you when you go to each character, when you you know, you pick one character and then you go to all the other ones, uh they follow the same damn formula. You know, you talk with them and you do a dungeon run and then you do a boss battle at the end and they just don't interact with each other. They just end up following you by the end. Yeah, that is super weird. 
and and when I I was like, nah, this can't be true. I, I looked up like some early reviews for people who have played 20 hours into the game and it doesn't change. Yeah, that's they just what have I heard separate, as well. Separate like chapters for each character. They don't interact other than some like little loading screen interactions and that's it. That is so weird. When the story starts, it you just see that one character there. You don't see any of the other characters around them. That is the weirdest thing ever. And this is a guy who what? Who made what? Final Fantasy VI? Was it Final Fantasy? I can't VI? remember. No, I don't think. I think maybe he was on the team. But is it? Isn't it one of the producers who made Bravely Default? Which yeah, was a really yeah. good game. I, yeah, yeah. I, but even that had its ridiculous play through the game once and then you have to do everything again with slightly different things that's so i I don't understand i don't understand it it, i i was just like i'm not gonna get this game (laughs) i'm not gonna get this game it uh, it it was a turn off automatically um it so i got in the mood for um because i enjoyed i enjoyed the the turn-based combat i was like okay this is not as bad as i thought it was maybe i'm just in the mood for it and i was like let me go play a game that's supposedly good and old school and i picked up final fantasy 7 i've never (laughs) you've never played ff7 no no i've never beat it i i played it multiple times when i was young and never beat it i am almost 40 hours in (laughs) Does it still hold up? Because because that's that's a risky sing. game to talk about nowadays. Yeah, FF Seven is like a ocarina levels of like fan insanity over it. I was interested because like I was like okay if I play the first couple hours and it doesn't draw me in I'll just I'll just quit it. You it's know? also good that you've played it before, because that means that, like, you know. You you at least aren't going to be like, what's up with these Super Nintendo sounds and the, the model quality? So so I assume we're at least not going to go through, like, that No, uh, it actually, trial. No, it's actually pretty... At least, okay, let, let me just start with the first disc. The first disc is, like, really good. <laughs> like, yeah, the, the, still? The, yeah, the, the camera angles, the music, like... Um, Ooh, which version also were you playing? I'm playing the PC there's a few. Version. I'm playing the PC. The latest one or the original PC version? Uh, the latest one where they switched the music back. Oh boy, because that that I think had some weird Square Enix DRM going on on the Steam version that they might have stripped out by now. Later though. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. It's, you just you just play. That's it. Nothing happens. Good. I, I don't know. Good. I don't good. Think good. The DRM is there. At least I w- it would show up, wouldn't it? Um, I, I didn't. I wasn't there when all sometimes that crazy if it stuff. works as intended, it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, nothing was going on. It n- there's been no problems whatsoever. Um, I I gotta say, like it, it's actually it's actually pretty pretty good, and it holds up in a weird old school way. Um, now when you it get, holds up in a weird, weird old, school old school way, way. <laughs> yeah like like okay if you were to go back to play like I'm it like, held I, up in 2002 but <laughs> okay when i played it i i understand why people like it you know and i don't yeah. get that from a lot of stuff that i play i'm like oh you know we were just in back in the days you know stuff like that but no yeah. no i i i think it's um the way they did certain stories were um were good it 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 you know how I, I've been gotten kind of bored with like JRPGs lately because the, the stories are always like just, just like cookie cutter like dumb, dumb stuff. And at least FF Seven <laughs> still has uh, retained its own unique setting and like visual style over the years. Yeah, like uh, this one, like the way that, um, for instance. The- um, I forgot her name already. Uh, the ancient girl. Oh, no. <laughs> Ares. Ares. Really? <laughs> the most important like character in video game, right? The, the Shakespearean plot twist hours to the in? third act. <laughs> like the way that, Ares. The way that Ares uh, oh, meets sorry, her I mean stepmother Aerith. is like good. Like that type of stuff. You know, the stepmother was waiting for 
her husband to come home every day and then like that type of like you don't get that out of the some of the jrpgs i've been playing it, it just kind of sucks there's a lot of things that uh, final fantasy 7 got right back then that games don't get right now like there's like this scene where they they backtrack um you know when you you, you meet you're, you're you're playing a part with cloud and sephiroth uh, am i spoiling shit I think I'm spoiling. Well, something. playing the part for with Final Cloud and Fantasy sounds... Seven, I think yeah, it's yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, like like it, like if you really haven't played Final Fantasy Seven, or if you care, you know that in 2028 we will get the Final Fantasy Seven HD remake. If you if you are waiting and holding out until then, don't listen. Okay, I think I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. I'll be quick. Um, the, the 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 way they flow the cutscenes and the gameplay together when you can still move your character on a PS one I was just like what <laughs> what did this yeah did this back that, then? Like, that this... opening cut is still I bet really really fun to watch yeah it is and I was like oh my god this this is dope and they do it throughout the whole game oh yeah I'm almost done with it but they do it throughout the whole game I was like wow like that's they really do some like cinematic tricks like. Um, there, when, when I was saying where, um, for instance, when you, you, first, you first start playing the game and you go to blow up the reactor and when you blow it up and your cloud is by them, uh, her, uh, his self and you talk to Ares real quick, just selling you know, flowers, you don't know who she is and you're just walking through the streets and it's like this quiet like atmosphere. And you just see people running around and you're like, oh, shit, did I just did I do, do something bad? Like, you don't know anything about the game and you're coming into that. It, that. it was actually well done. Like, I don't know, like little things like that. There's just another part where um, where they use backtracking um, the early on anyway, because later on, they kind of messed that up. But early on um, where you you talk to Sephiroth and Sephiroth is going nuts, you know, reading all this stuff, finding out who he is. And they skip the backtracking to go back up the stairs. But then when you go see him again and you realize that he um, he's like, oh, um, you know, you, you think he's going to do something. You, they make you walk all the way back up the stairs slowly with this like this music this whole time. And then once you get outside, like they, they, they constantly give the player like breath to breathe. And you're like in your mind, you're thinking about stuff. And then when, when you see it, you're like, oh, shit, like, you know, the Seth, Seth Ross is like killing everybody and stuff like it, there's a lot of those little moments in there that they did so right. And the camera angles are just really good when they <laughs> for such an old game, like games now just don't don't really understand. I don't, I don't know how they're going to pull this off as a remake, though. That's the thing. Yeah. Sorry, I'm gushing about I, this. I, I, an episodic I, I, remake as well. But I also think it's really interesting that you're getting a kick out of this camera system because I think that like those predefined camera angles are a real lost art. You had a lot of in in a weird way that then in a different way than it happens nowadays. You had collaborations with cinematographers and directors going on back in the like late '90s, turn of the millennium, to figure out where to put camera angles for those pre-rendered backgrounds, and that's that's like a whole aspect of game development that has been obsoleted at this point since since manually controllable cameras have become ubiquitous. Yeah, I I mean when you think about talking to Sephiroth in the library, you you hit, you see that crooked angle in the library in that hall. Like you remember that. You remember that. Like I remember that even as a kid. It's like, oh yeah. Like, and I it, remember it's like that uneasy... opening shot of yeah? the, the, the camera like swooping in on the train and then your character is actually popping out of it straight into the battle. Like the camera swooping from the sky down into the city to an individual train that seamlessly like turns into an in-game render scene. It was a really cool moment. And I'm like weirdly happy to hear that it still is. It, it is. It is. It, even for such an old game. <laughs> An old game. I I thought it was, I I thought it wasn't gonna get blown away like this, but it, it was. It's actually pretty good. Um, again, like there's some certain things like Cloud dressing up as a girl and going inside the rape dungeon and all this type of stuff. Have you gotten to the part where he is up in a in a like wheelchair yet? Yes. With like. Because <laughs> I bet that <laughs> part is like the roughest to go back to. Yeah, there's there's a lot of like, I don't know, like after the first disc, 
is not as quite as good. <laughs> yeah, I remember that game going <laughs> weird places. Yeah, it, 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 the first disc is great, but the, everything after is just like it's it's good. It's just um, they don't explain certain things well. You know, you have to really like pay attention. I mean, and they do go over things over and over again and they actually give new information when they go over it again, like because they didn't say it during the original scenes when it was actually happening. It's it's really weird. I was like, is some of this stuff lost in translation? I, I don't know, like because it was pretty decent before, but now it's just a little confusing. And then you, you get maybe they're trying to like string you along because later on they do explain a few things about cloud and stuff, but that's like hours later after they introduce that you know he may not be who he think he is and stuff like that and bum, still bum, that's bum. kind of still kind of like weird there you know you, you still don't know certain things of why he has like right now in the game like why does he have zach's memories and stuff like that like it, it, it just don't explain stuff properly um and and stuff gets a little it gets a little weird sometimes. Yeah, Again, the, I don't know how the remake is going to go. I just don't think they're going to be able to pull it off. To be honest. For as much commendation as people give the writing and characterization of FF7, I I don't know. I've always been more of like a Western RPG kind of guy. I played through the PlayStation 1 Final Fantasies when I was a kid, and I, I loved them all, but they never really took as big a place in my heart as, as like... Morrowind, and I think one of the weird reasons why is is that when you're we're going through like a linear story that's up to the the whims of the developers, you can tell sometimes when they are just making this shit up as they go along. Yeah. And the second half of FF7 struck me like that. Like I remember one MacGuffin coming up after another that walked you through the usual process of going to like the snow level, the lava level. Wasn't there like an Egyptian tomb themed level at some yeah. point too? Yeah. And <laughs> and there were some some great set piece moments at, at the very end and disc one. And halfway through you like have this, this this um, reprise, relaxation, vacation where you go on a date at a theme park. I think I ended up with Tifa, but some people end up with Ares, which would be really unfortunate because the the ooh, big yeah. spoiler plot is like shortly after that relaxing death yeah. scene, which I, I, I don't know if that's really good or bad pacing after all these years. But I remember going like snowboarding at one point on, on, in like Red Thirteen's area, having really cool music, horrible. but just kind of feeling like I. And I remember completely tuning out of what was even happening when Cloud ends up in a wheelchair with memory loss, because I think it involved some magical artifact that cropped up in the middle of the story at that point that had never been mentioned before, Black because they had to cram in. Yeah, they had to cram in another another dungeon and i am wondering if if that is like harder to deal with nowadays than back then even though disc one may still be totally fine if not pretty good yeah yeah this one is is pretty good it, it, this the mini games and stuff they start introducing and the splitting up of characters and because you you picked your favorite characters or the characters you want to stay with they're they're out leveled and it's annoying to go back and level them there's um issues where they don't tell you where to go so you're just kind of going everywhere and you're like you you want to give up and just look up a, a freaking guide as where do i go because you, it's just too much it's just too much i don't want to do that right now i don't I, I i'm not for linear games but like my god if they give me an airship and there's like like 12 towns to go to you know, oh, guess what? When I was a kid playing FF7, I totally missed Yuffie. Or Yuffie. Oh, me too. Oh, you missed her town completely? And I felt it's not a town. lucky that, that I a got random, Cerberus. It's a random, like, you go inside the forest and she fights you. That's yeah, it. You just got to oh, explore yeah. the shit out of that game to get everything. And they're really major shit you can miss. Yeah. And she... And the, the the secret characters like Vincent and Woofy, like they don't Vincent, really add, that was the guy. Yeah, they don't add anything. I I mean I liked Vincent as a kid because I thought he was cool, but of course I did. Look at the guy. Yeah, the guy is I'm the wondering guy is cool. And he comes how he, off, how he comes I thought off he as was an so adult. I thought he was so cool that Dirge of Cerberus was like 
my most hyped game for a while. Uh -huh. I was like, fuck yeah! <laughs> Vincent's getting his own game, and it's going to be like an action RPG, and he's going to fucking shoot, shoot shit. And it's going to be on the PlayStation 2 and have like Final Fantasy 7 graphics in like, in like up res 3D. It's going to be amazing. And then I played it. Yeah, and it was... It was garbage. Okay. <laughs> it was a linear corridor, fucking with no like oh, weight game to was, the feels of the controls. Game was bad. They they so bad. They, how are they gonna handle the curse words? How are they gonna handle like? There's sometimes they they reference some people as uh. <laughs> never mind. Um, they they say they they use retarded. They use like. I wonder, like, in this day and age where everyone's offended about everything, how this game is going to be received, if they do an exact remake, or are they just going to change a lot? They won't. They'll change it. They'll change. The localization will change. The Japan side might be the same, because Japan is Japan, you know? We got, you know, Hideki Kamiya, like, <laughs> do you see Kamiya the other day? Like, if anyone speaks to me in English on Twitter, they're getting fucking blocked. You insects are getting blocked. <laughs> you can only speak to him in Japanese now. You know, Japan is Japan, right? So Japan probably I mean, won't change. But, have you been on the um, internet? I don't blame him. <laughs> but specifically, he's like, you can insult me if you do it in Japanese, you insects. <laughs> oh my God. What a... But like, the, the one thing I'm like more interested in, and cool I don't, dude, there I is guess. like, there is no comparison to it. It's like, how the fuck are you? Are you just gonna remake that game anyway? Like, as as Aren't a game, they calling like, it more of a reimagining at this point anyway. They haven't oh, said anything. Man. They've said like it's it's a re, it's a remake. Like it's an episodic remake of an RPG that was like isometric in view, but now they're making it an action combat RPG that's episodic. Like, like it's, how do you change that into that? Like, I am so intrigued to see how they do that. I can't wait it's for just Barrett gonna be to be like different. the classic black character. You know? Oh my god! Dies Whoa. first. Like, he's just gonna be... He's, just gonna be, he's gonna be the stereotypical Sacrifices black. himself to save the group. <laughs> well, we got some... I got, I got some breaking news for you about Octopath Traveler, though, Matt. <laughs> The uh, the embargo just just broke on well not broke but the embargo was just lifted on the uh, reviews. Oh god! Do you want to do you want to give a do you want to give a, a hesitant guess at the um, score? The, let, the let's current go with a nice seven. Oof. Seven. It's it's got it's got a lot of sevens. Yeah. But the current uh, the the uh, open oh, critic don't you dare, don't you, score. Don't you dare. Oh, I'm bringing is, it up myself. Is 84. Oh. Yeah, oh that's, not, that's not that bad. Of course it has an 84. That's like, yeah, that's that's the safe. I don't know. I feel like going a little lower than 84 is a little safer. 84 is actually higher than I was yeah, expecting. Yeah, that's way higher. Yeah, than like I'm looking, based on I'm what I've heard I'm all scanning, of us say and playing myself. I'm scanning the Rosetta era thread, and I'm scanning like the, the things, and it's like... I, People get testy about review scores and whatever. If you don't want to hear them, you know, and find out in your own time, don't listen. But, like, you know, it's got, like, an 8. It's a Nintendo Life gave it a 9. RPG Site gave it a 7. GameSpot, an 8. Destructo, 7.5. Yeah, it's kind of all around the same. So it's Jason like Shrier the safely from Kotaku, who's like upper JRPG end of man. mediocre scores. I feel like it's so, because wait, wait, we have wait, this Kotaku, dry, dry season Kotaku of said, this. That's why people are gonna be. Playing I think. I think so. Yeah. So, so Kotaku, like Jason Schreier, said, "Octopath Traveler is a beautiful game with one of the best soundtracks I've heard. The combat system rocks and will hopefully be used more in Square Enix games to come. There are plenty of good ideas in here, but the game is too grindy, too repetitive, and too full of structural problems to be viewed as much more than another botched JRPG mm. experiment." So then, and something did he that you it? end up. He, yeah, what's he, the number? It's Kotaku. It doesn't have a number. Oh, okay. what's the, uh, the verdict story. they use? I think I think they give it a I think I think it's a yes. Yeah. I, mean, okay. let me I don't check. remember if they were the like buy, rent, try, yeah. don't bother. I hate they, they, I just hate the thought of something taking up forty hours of my life, being kind of repetitive and dull and feeling like a waste of time by the end of it and getting an eight. I, I, I weirdly feel 
I, I, oh, I feel so, like, confused and conflicted now, because what I did play of Octopath was, like, cute and pretty, but I could kind of see where it was going, and then it was, like, I, I kind of wish it was both, A, more socially acceptable to only play, and like, Matt, five, six hours until you're fine. Matt, like, um, he, I don't know if this is spoilers for the game, uh, in terms of, like, how it, it carries on from what you were talking about with the stories, uh, it says there's been a lot of confusion over whether Octopath Traveler's eight different stories overlap or lead to some sort of epilogue, like a, an overarching story. Uh, after finishing all eight, Jason shares, uh, nothing happens, really. No, there's, <laughs> well, there's, nothing, there's nothing really like that. Then but, why? But then... you can get a kick out of the art ahead of time. I, I wish it was like more socially acceptable to also review games as such. Like I'm interested in playing this thing, and I'd be interested in buying a like ten dollar version that was just shorter. In Octopath Traveler, all eight stories are so repetitive that they blend together, forming one big bland stew. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's exactly mm. what I thought the reviews would say. Because that's Big what you get from it. Stew. Like you, when you play a game and the beginning of the game is like that, like just just the same thing over and over again, and they don't interact with each other, they don't say anything. The the the, the story is so boring. Yeah, but it's There's competently no made. It's it has fun combat. Up. So eight out of ten. <laughs> Like, it's just like George, like, when is this going to get good? Like, no, no, I don't <laughs> want that. I don't want that from a game. I don't want Yeah, that. and as I've gotten older, it's more like, okay, I'd rather just put it down now while it's still good. <laughs> like, Instead I, of I think, watch it I think decay. It, yeah, yeah, I think I think this is one of those where it's like, the more you play, the more you realize there's a lot of cop, cut and copy content and, like, the stories sort of have similar... Like, I don't understand, like, unless it's, like, the name or the pillar of the game that you're going for these eight pathways, why not just have six and dedicate, like, Hectopath time to traveler. fleshing out, like, six stories instead, uh, or, or four, you know? Quadrapath traveler. Like, you can, you can, like, I think it's, it's difficult for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult for us to judge because we haven't played the full game or finished it, so, you know. We might have wildly different opinion, yeah, I mean, a, 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 opinions from Jason, but like you can only have four people in your party at one time anyway, and they they each character can have a second job class, like Bravely Default or you know Final Fantasy V or whatever. Like, why not make it like f four person traveler and have four incredibly cool stories that all intertwine together, and then you have a reason to travel and. It reminds me edge. of um, Setsuna. Yeah. Oh, that was like the like, Chrono Trigger. Like, yeah, and, and the whole while I was just thing. like, okay, why are we doing this again? Like, what's what's the gimmick? What's the compelling and that hook had, like, to bring it back? That had like an interesting like start, didn't it? Like you were like meant to kill Setsuna, right? And then like, like the start of the game, you're meant to like kill her, but then it ends up you. Because everyone yeah. decides that sacrificing a village girl isn't a good idea to do every few years as a I, ritualistic yeah. practice. It's never, it's never really worked in any form of uh, civilization prior. Who writes you might as well this garbage? <laughs> Who freaking? I beat I am Sasuna first of all, so I can I can say that. Like, it's, it's, who writes this? That was another one where I like clocked out after a while, and I loved JRPGs as a kid. Yeah, but it but, has been a long, long time, and maybe I, I need to play I Nino Kuni too. But it's been a long no, you and don't. um, you don't. Xenoblade. Don't I, oh. just ignore that because I I've again I've I played too many JRPGs lately. They all kind of just, they're the same. They're just. There's yeah, okay. like, like since There's the PS3 okay. era, I've really clocked out of my interest in the genre, and it makes me sad. I do attempt it. I like pick up these these new like retro themed Square Enix RPG Factory style stuff, but they're not hooking me. I, I, I it's weird because like you know I spoke about Ease Eight or Ez Eight as the people Ezu. emailed criticizing the way I pronounced it. It's like it's fucking Japanese anyway. 
Like, yeah, one guy sent me those the, emails. One guy sent me the French version. And was like, this is how you say. It. I'm like, yeah, that's the French way of saying well, it. Like, it was interesting to read about because it's literally like all lost in translation. Like it's everyone arguing over their different localizations of how to pronounce yeah. wise the series. Wise. Ease. When, it's, when it's, I don't know, I gotta give you credit S for going for the easy. original Japanese title version yeah. of the game. In, Jap in Japanese, it's easy, so easy kind of sounds, you know, like you know. <laughs> anyway, you know, I like that game has undeniable problems. It's janky as fuck. Like it's it is full of JRPG cliches, but the combat's really fun, and I go, I you know, spoke about it a lot, and then like. So many of the comments are like, thanks for shitting on ease. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, are you oh, enjoying God. playing right. that game? Damage control. Um, guys, you can play yeah. whatever you want to play. Whatever floats your boat. Um, in our, in, in, in my humble opinion. Whatever tickles your pink. I, I just don't, I just don't care to waste my time grinding for a story that's uninteresting, interesting to me. That's it. That's I it. like JRPGs, but, but I will well, okay. admit, when like, you, you say know, when, that, what what are you thinking about when you say that? When you say do you know I what like I'm JRPGs, about more than anything, I'm I'm thinking of aesthetic <laughs> more than anything. <laughs> no, FF nine. I like JRPGs by aesthetic. FF. I I when I think about them, I think <laughs> about the aesthetic of a JRPG. I like everything about them. You know, like the victory chimes. When you ba, ba, when you ba, win ba, and, ba, and he goes, ba, 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 you know, <laughs> you, or like <laughs> stupid shit where you have like NPCs talking fully voiced and then it changes to text boxes and it's like <laughs> when you're like oh, scrolling along like. By the way, that's you know, right. Octo did not have voice. Act you said it had all voice acting. It does I know. Not. The more I played, the more I played, <laughs> the more I realized. <laughs> it immediately turns off. I was like, no. It, I, I think it's no, because Liam. one of the stories what? I started. No, like one of the stories I started had loads of voice acting. I was like, oh, this is gr this is great. But yeah, yeah, you're right. It's traditional, right? Same as all, all RPGs. You know, you and got a little bit of voice moves. acting. It's great. Hmm. And it's like, <gasps> Mm. Thank you. Nice. Mm. You know, it's like, it's stupid shit. I love, I love stupid shit. Like, I'm playing Ease, Esu, Wise, whatever. Play Ease, and like, Ease has this really cool thing where you have to do, like, uh, it's like, it's almost like a mini game, but like, you, you know, the game is about being on a, a deserted island. So you set up a camp, and it's called the Castaway Camp. And you're like, getting castaways to come join your camp. And then you have to defend it in like, basically, not tower defense, but like like gears of war wave based things, right? You have to take on waves of enemies while protecting like uh, these bait traps and uh, you know trying to defend the barricades of your camp. And it's really interesting to see like a JRPG have like wave based combat, and that is a testament to how fun like the combat is in Ease Eight, right? But stupidly like with all like jrpgs there's no sense of urgency whatsoever so it's like supposedly like oh shit like all of these beasts are descending upon the camp we must rally everyone to defend the camp and then as soon as like that conversation ends it's like all of the npcs standing around a campfire waiting for you to be like so are you ready to take on the hordes yet and you're like nah i need to cook some more fish soup and you're like okay then <laughs> it's like you sit there like cooking making potions talking with people you talk to one of the npcs who was just like shouting at you and screaming that the barricades are going to be broken and he's like hey have you collected enough wood for me to make a bench yet <laughs> you're like dude two minutes ago you were talking about the urgency of which we must defeat the beasts like stupid stuff like that makes jrpgs fun and weird and and their own unique thing for me and that's what i think about and uh, and i like playing games that give me that feeling i think it's more of a f wanting that feeling like that safety of like ah i remember when all playstation 2 jrpgs were like this this was a lot of fun um but then when i hear a game is grindy now i'm just like i'm out because you know it's gotten worse now. Now games are built to be these like lifestyle pillars of of never ending garbage side quests you're not even supposed to do. Yummy. Yeah. It's really funny you say that as well because surprisingly enough, I don't know why it took me this long, but today I watched George's video on Nier Automata. Mm -hmm. 
I was, I was, for some reason, I was browsing YouTube and it came up, and I realized I hadn't watched it because I was holding off for a while. I mean, uh, near Autonomous' I... never-ending list of side quests are better than, than and that's the thing. But the you first. talked about some of them just being like unbearable. In the first game, I remember genuinely disliking, if not like the, the side quest kind of ruining the whole thing for me. And as I was talking to near fans, they were like, "No, don't do those. You're not supposed to do those. Why are you doing those?" And I was like shrugging being like what if there's a diamond in the rough in there like and why are they in the game if they're bad content right. like bad anyway they were just like, a waste of time and uh, uh, look there are going to be so many people who listen to this and you can play whatever you like and jrpgs are great like so many of them are like we've just spoken about final fantasy 7 for like 20 minutes you know like matt's really enjoying it and there are great ones out there but it's hard to play them now i think like, unless that's, like, your jam, like, that's your thing. You don't really play any other types of games. Like, you play JRPGs. Like, you just, you have a, 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 an unrequenting so love. It's like, that I feel like just like playing being... them casually is going to be happening at the expense of other, of exploring other genres. Yeah. Like, if you, if you really think about it, like, how many hours, Matt, for example, right? Matt, you work a full-time job. Yeah. You know, you do secondary stuff, like... Like this like the podcast and others like how many hours a day do you have if you like cut out like cooking and all that kind of stuff like maximum how many hours a day would you have to play games if you want it probably if if i had to force gaming hours probably like around three and i would maybe lose a little bit of sleep it depends on how early or late i work Okay, so that's a maximum. If we, if you said you did that every day, that's twenty-one hours. That's only twenty-one hours. Mm -hmm. That is the tutorial to Final Fantasy Thirteen. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> you know that that would take you one week. Wait, is thirteen? Taking... No, that's that's not an MMO. That has even less no. an excuse. That's mm. the joke about thirteen, isn't it? You know that uh, everything. It's like hour tutorial. so many well, the of these JRPGs. With the Afro, right? Yeah. The, the bird yes. lives in. Zaz. Yeah. I, I, so, I, so that was many when of Buckbuster these... was still around. I rented it and returned it the same day. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how bad it was. I was like, yeah, maybe I'm, maybe this is not my thing anymore. That's that's when I, like, I finally. Yeah, it I out. used to be able I... to rent JRPGs. They were great as rental games because they moved along and and had endings without a lot of bullshit distracting you on the way there. It's weird because, like, I don't think it's just JRPGs. Like, I think, obviously, we're hopping on JRPGs, I think, because their gameplay is stunted to be like that. It's meant to stretch over a period of time. So bosses are purposely hard, so you have to grind for hours to make the game longer. Uh, longer yeah, than it needs to be sometimes. you want to mash your controllers during those summons. Yeah, and it's like, games are ridiculously long, and it's not even that. I think it's just... You know, 21 hours, especially with games where, you know, people say, oh, it gets really good after, like, 40 or 50 hours. You know, Whoa. like, that game gets amazing. And it's like, yeah, that's like, if I sacrificed all of my time for two weeks, like, I could get to that point. And it's like, am I going to want to do that? It's not even JRPGs. Like, I haven't finished God of War because it's, like, 40 hours. I'd really like to do a more serious in-depth look into time management of various genres and styles of games because I am rediscovering something that I feel has been lost. One aspect of which is fucking manageable time management playing of video games. But I've been playing something that starts off really freaking good, that can hook people for freaking ever and stay good, and something that manages to appeal to all sorts of weird, weird age uh, uh, and gender and interest demographics that don't match up with video games, that still manages to appeal to the hardcore gamer kids. And uh, it's, it's magical. I've, I've been replaying The Sims 2. Wow, and I, I not can't I believe this say. shit. The Sims well, but when you think about it, like what other game meets all of those previous qualifications? Like The Sims Two is is a pick up and play, uh, casual arcade, but also like hardcore micromanagement strategy 
game that in, that that has this big element of like player expression and customization to it, while also having this element of of playing around with uh, meter management that involves strategies, time management. You, you can uncover stories behind the Sims. They put little mysteries for you to solve, give you little goals and pop up menus that create player driven uh, uh, adventures of trying to improve the lives of the weird families they set you out with in the beginning, which is a thread that permeates through the console versions that are like actually story driven adventures that that are like an implication for these PC versions that's really really fun to think about as you're playing through it's like a fun group activity i had multiple mice plugged into the computer for for me and the girlfriend to like swap between our two sims and play them at the same time and when i <laughs> it's it's a huge huge beast to get working on modern computers though and there's a can of worms of operating system incompatibilities with Windows 10. But when I was looking up help on getting them to work, I was just like surprised at every turn of the way. There were forum threads written by like sweet old ladies who will like get a hold of their son's old like hand-me-down gamer rigs when they become obsolete, who will like write these forum threads trying to know how to tweak their operating systems graphics card temporary page memory file just so they could play the sims and and i was looking up another youtube guide on on windows 10 compatibility and and the, the narrating the narrator was was like a older middle-aged black woman and i was like how I, I felt like I was in an arcade in Japan again, where, like, boys and girls and old people and young people were all just playing the same games harmoniously. Why, why The Sims 2, though? Yeah. Uh, that's you, you, good... you make it sound like it's not, like, this game that you, you control people with. Like, you, you make it sound like some, like, ser like, strategy game, you know, RTS style. I, I can't imagine you know, George playing it like a strategy game, though. The Sims 2, like, way too much just now. Guess, well, yeah. They added, I like, can imagine so him much making... stuff that uh, has goals and checklists of content to go through. <laughs> like, there's, there's... If you took away The Sims 2, people would not know that you were talking about The Sims 2. <laughs> <laughs> but I... <laughs> In what other game has life itself become digital? I mean, there's The Sims oh 3 and 4, but it, but at that point, it feels like they were just kind of uh, streamlining on stuff back to resell expansion packs and content for big major features I don't care about. Like, whoa, you can load in multiple houses in the same instance. But somehow, when we get to The Sims 4, that comes at the sacrifice of pools and snooker yeah, tables. One, once again, I ask, why The Sims 2 and not, you know... The Sims 3 awful. Or, or Second Life, one. for that matter. For, for some reason, I've had a hankering. It, it was a big pillar of, of my childhood PC gaming, but The Sims 1 and 2. And, and I made custom content for both of them growing up. It was a lot of fun. But for some reason, I've had a hankering lately. I've been looking at the various like handheld and console versions. I was like thinking how fun it would be to just pull up a good version of The Sims whenever I'm out and about and on the go. It sounds like a great time waster. So when I set up the new computer, I had downloaded the Origin client and downloaded Battlefield 1 to, uh, you know, give it a stress test to see a modern game with good-looking graphics run well on a modern computer. But when I saw that they had given away The Sims 2 on Origin, the ultimate collection that includes all, it includes the university, the pets expansion, the whatever expansion gives you magic and enchanting and, and alchemy systems, uh, along with the like Ikea stuff pack. There's officially licensed Ikea in there. You got the, the Guy Fieri uh, uh, food pack. You got um, uh, Anthony you Bourdain's are, travel, travel fun pack. You are that quintessential person who builds a brand new, goddamn, <laughs> expensive, high spec PC, there and then you play Sims 2 and play Morrowind. Like, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My gaming tastes are like rooted in in the middle turn of the millennium. So too too damn hard. I can't get out of that place. Can you play The Sims 2 at 144 hertz? 
You can play. Okay, okay. After installing the four gigabyte patch, does it have a uh, turbo mode? You got to activate large address aware. Give it four gigs of texture memory. Uh, have a custom graphics rules config so that your new graphics card is something that the game can detect and account for. After a lot of tweaking, I was finally able to get a stable build of The Sims 2 running at 1440p at an officially supported 100 hertz. <laughs> <laughs> on my fancy, on my fancy new Asus gaming PC. Well, no, it's an <laughs> Acer gaming monitor with an Asus motherboard, I think. But anyways, there's some asses in there, and and you, you got like like I was saying earlier, like like goal based, progression based systems with completion and objectives. One of which is going to college. You can make a sim that goes to college. You're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to manage your time good to, to complete college. And you come out of it with a lot of skill points and connections to hook your sim up with their job. Which is really a non-issue in the Sims universe. They live in a utopia where you get hired the same day you see the ad in the newspaper. With no education or even a job interview required. Jobs in the Sims... Employers in the Sims take literally anybody... Including, like, aliens and zombies. Yeah, my zombie dad got a job as a clerk at a law office. Anyways, um, I made a sim that had to go to college and complete college. And, and at some point in college, he came across a magic lantern. Uh, he wished for wealth, and a genie gave him about $40,000. And, uh... Ah, yes, the true, the true, uh, sticking to the trueness of life. Yeah, yeah, it Genies. Was, my my sim who went to college for about 20 days with you know no requirements required uh he got paid at the end of every semester for making good grades the university gave him like 1200 bucks for an a plus report card because that's how that works he he, he got his forty thousand dollar uh kickstarter fund from a magical genie um <laughs> The, the girlfriend then made a self-insert. We played the same family for a while. Moved out to a starter home where uh, she flunked out of college. And uh, and still could afford a home? Yeah. Yeah. Houses in The Sims are like $12,000. And jobs Did pay. You? Like even the slacker career track, which includes as its opening entry level job, gas station convenience store clerk, which is not a slacker job at all. That's a like small business entrepreneurial either I don't know, making ends meet in the short term or someone who wants to own the gas station kind of job. That's not a slacker career track. I'm pretty sure that what what I do would be the slacker career track for the Sims. <laughs> the Sims 5 YouTuber career Patreon sponsored oh career Yeah, like a telephone <laughs> in The Sims will be unexpectedly expensive they're, they're like 50 to 70 dollars to put a landline telephone in your Sims house but when your Sim walks home that day with their 150 dollar daily paycheck or comes home from school with their 1200 dollar education grant uh, the the uh, economics of it start to become a lot more forgiving. But anyways, um, yeah, I'm like having a blast with this thing. I'm amazed at <laughs> how much there is to explore and do and how like compelling the loop of uh, buy, build, and live are all uh, together. I'm, I'm becoming obsessed with it all over again. What's happening? Are you well, we've gone from uh, with, uh, flooding academia to fi <laughs> uh unfortunately oh oh yeah I'll just uh I'll just I'll just like cut that out of the oh, outline no. I <laughs> oh, no. I watched like the first three episodes two weeks ago and had a blast and I've been having blasts doing other things since then I knew it I knew it I knew it I called it I <laughs> I'm still going to try, it. I can't believe it. I called it. <laughs> Fucking hell, George. Oh, leave that sucker in, boy. <laughs> it's like something I've been... 
Okay, every single night before I go to bed, I've looked at my tablet and thought about it. I thought about picking up the next episode, but for whatever reason, I end up going to sleep and say, It's been on the back of my mind, and I want to know what happens still. <laughs> Three episodes in. You then didn't you've got like, any four, good you've got like 52 episodes to catch up with. Well, that was on. a really good. In the second episode, I, I posted a big rant in our Discord server about how much I loved it. Yeah, but yeah, but uh, uh, stop playing The Sims. You played The Sims. Yeah, because it's fun. You played the Sims. It's a fun computer game, and that's what I like more than fun animes. <laughs> oh, well, we've gone from uh, Final Fantasy love. Seven mm. to Sims Two to you know we we spoke about games from many many years ago that matter to no one now and anime and abusing george about it we're we're, we're full on cliche love. dad and sons episode here yeah yeah i love all things i lose interest in equally mm. well we did just talk about games that george drops if they lose interest so i guess he just lost interest in Boku no hero i still have well. interest in it though no, he's never I'll gonna watch, watch it again so no, he, he, he's done any he's done he's done any he's man done. He's, he's done oh! He's done. And so is this podcast. Beyond the edge of reality lies a story of ultimate conquest. A story of war and friendship. A story of a love that can never be. And a hatred that always was. And now, the most anticipated epic adventure of the year will never come to a theater near you. Final Fantasy 7. Yo, Sid, park this turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how that's, you're bringing us back? That's, that's, that's Barrett. <laughs> From what we can expect in Final Fantasy 7 Remake. <laughs> nice. That's. Nice black that's man the, there. All right. That's so the back return. To, to the podcast and the news. What do we have in the world of Monster Hunter? <laughs> that's that has that was just a line from Barrett from Final Fantasy VII. Well, why did you why did you <laughs> no, bring George, us back with that? George, no, Sid, George, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, George, Advent you're children, very wrong. Or, George is from Advent Children. Oh, don't yeah, don't yeah. get twisted. <sighs> Why? Because because on the break, okay, I'll, I'll admit, I was talking to Matt about Barrett, and I said, M Matt in his Skype photo has similar <laughs> hair to Barrett. And Matt was talking about how Matt, like Barrett is in the HD remake going to be like generic black guy. So Matt was then doing the voice. So he says, and then yo... Yes. Yeah. So then we pulled up lines from the film, and we realized Barrett only has like six lines in the entire film, <laughs> and they have and the one word of them. Yo, with them. And one of them is Yo, Sid, park this turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Where the hell you been? That is Marlene better be safe, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you let her know who rides, Spikey. <laughs> Speaking what up, of fool? Japanese, it's I'm the man. <laughs> Speaking of Japanese companies having a, a weird time appealing to the rest Dilly of the world, dally, shilly shally. Uh, the 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 gritty open world Monster Hunter reboot, which includes a more story driven cinematic campaign, will be arriving on PCs earlier than expected on August 9th. That is pretty cool, though. Yeah, like, that's just that one month. We got like, one when month we get prepare, surprised Matt. with shit like that, you're like, oh shit, like that's less than a month away and we, we get to play it on PC already. And and I I know I'm going to do it. Matt, are Finally, you going to do it? Finally, you can use that fucking PC for something. <laughs> Instead of The Sims 2 and Morrowind. I, I, I tell you, I've played like a, a 30 minutes of Battlefield on that thing and 10 hours of two of the above on that thing i like i like also how you put the minimum specs in our podcast document yes almost very important almost very important almost to like show off that your pc now is more powerful than the minimum specs uh, but the minimum specs are something that's important because that that <laughs> highly limits the amount of your initial install base you're gonna want a gtx 760 
and an i3 at four gigs, which, yeah, seems a little steep, but at the same time, Monster Hunter World seems to have really, really beautiful yeah, graphics. Yeah, that game so is pretty. It's a pretty they, game. They, they, they got it scaled back enough to work okay a on a PS4. Is not bad, though. 760, that's like... If you, if you put a 1050 in there, you're good. How much are they these days with the uh, GPU prices all it's thrown not that out of whack anymore? That, that's that's an old thing now. <laughs> well, eBay's got one for eighty dollars, uh, but that's an eBay auction. It might be pre. Yeah, it looks like Newegg selling them new for a hundred forty. Yeah, they're, they're, so they're pretty... you'd need a hundred and forty dollar upgrade if, if you do not meet those minimums. If yeah, if and it's most. It, it'll be better to get a 1050 Ti as well, but yeah. Wait, wait, no, I might have, I might have been looking at the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, if you don't have a, a 760, I would have sp spent 180 bucks get a 1050 Ti. You good? You're sweet. You're golden. Yeah, yummy. Let's yummy. see. Let's see if if Amazon has seven. Oh, well, we're not. 60s. We're not doing this. We're, we we're not that podcast. <laughs> We're not cheap ass so gamer. Only. Come on, man. <laughs> what's going on here? CLO. Wait, I think yeah, the 760 used to be a high end model from years ago. Oh, yeah. okay. Didn't everything used to be a high end model? Online? Right, right. <laughs> so, so like the equivalent nowadays. As equivalent nowadays, would I'm be like heavily a editing this. <laughs> that's what I, I started with a PC. It was like. <laughs> Four years ago, so I have no idea what new high-end graphics cards are actually. But but I mean, Matt, are you are you gonna throw into it? Can you not wait to hunt monsters in the world on PC on August 9th? Because I know I can't. I, I if if my people get it, then I'll I'll get it. Your people, Matt, you, my my friends, you nearly my my friends. I don't want to. I'm not playing that game by myself. If, if none of my friends say, oh, I'm getting it, I'm not going to buy that. Like, that's not oh, the type I'm of game. Oh, I'm getting it. That's not the type of You game nearly game. bought a PS4 for it. Yeah. Well, what? You 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 were so close to buying a PlayStation 4 I know, for I it. Like, yeah, I know. I know. I thought you'd be frothing at the mouth. You know, the high now it's high high, out, you know, PC. It, it, it kind of goes away. It comes and goes. Did, did work beat it out of you? Work did beat it out of me. <laughs> when, I <think> about, <laughs> when I think about $60, you know, like it's like, oh, okay, you know, hmm. I got I to gotta weigh the, the amount of time and how much I work each week. Hmm. Well, well, I might hook you up in that case. Hook me up with with with, with a sweet like re um, review code. Uh, the, um, <laughs> I don't know if I'll be getting a review code, but you but do still get review. You're not. Uh, I do, but oh. sometimes not for the big expensive games. The big. Expensive. I get review codes for like everything below the thirty dollar mark. I want to say. Uh, for everything he doesn't want. <laughs> <laughs> that's what well, my and that's stuff that my other inbox. people might want. I do the I do the inbox thing, but but putting in requests. Hey, for all you YouTuber boys out there, putting in requests for expensive games is a little harder than the cheaper ones. But, but that's besides the point. Matt, I'll hook you up. I, I'm. I'm excited about this. I'm looking forward to this. This is earlier than expected to. They previously said fall, and does like does August 9th even count as fall? Uh, I guess no. like August it's, is it's technically the, fall, what? but the first half of no. August does not feel feel like fall. It's like dead middle of the year. August? It's the eighth, eighth. month of the year. You're more than halfway through like, done with the year. Ah, oh, come on, fall. <laughs> August like feel, October. Maybe in Japan to. In Atlanta, August gets fall e like towards Dude, the end I'm of the month. I'm not fucking sweating my ballsack off in like the fall. It's fucking it's it's summer. It's still summer. I'm assuming there's not cross <laughs> play with PS4. Ooh, there's not. Yeah, probably not because saying? of you know Sony's cross play policies. Oh yeah. But so far as I know, I don't think there's any official words on that. And I don't know. I'm, like, actually kind of excited to get away from Monster Hunter Generations. Because I like the combat. I like the loop to it. I just want some kind of narrative. Yeah. Ugh. 
something. I need some kind of narrative to this thing. It feels so weird and kind of boring having no real problems facing like this universe. No, no big problem, I guess. Like you were going to work as a monster hunter solving people's little problems, but they're not fleshed out like like big side quests like in The Witcher when you solve people's monster problems. They're they're contained within one to three text boxes of story. And I I want to do the same shit. I just want to, like, get out and feel like I can be immersed in the thing. Yeah. Instead of feel like I'm playing a time waster video game. Yeah. Well, I think, you I think you know, you guys are going to enjoy it. Especially if you can play together. That together. Forever. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's see. Speaking of... Uh, speaking of rearranging your headcanon to achieve immersion... Okay. Uh, a Naughty Dog animator has confirmed that according to Naughty Dog's in-house headcanon, Nathan Drake in the Uncharted series of action shooter video games is not actually taking bullet damage when he gets hit by bullets in those video games. His luck is just steadily running out until the final bullet kills him, which is the one that the enemies actually manage to aim competently. Uh, this animator in question is Jonathan Cooper. He was uh, pointing out how during a mega swing uh, animation, Nathan Drake just does not take damage, even though there's all these bullets flying <laughs> in his general direction, if not into the body of himself. But, but Jonathan Cooper, Naughty Dog animator, was like, Side note I learned on joining the team, Drake doesn't ever take bullet damage. The red UI that shows hits is to represent his, quote, luck running out. Eventually enemies will get a clear shot and kill him if he takes enough near misses. Amy Hennig then followed up. True, that was the original intention, to stay more aligned with the spirit and tone of the films we were homaging. Guys, this changes everything. Oh my god. Ah, I know, right? Right? Suddenly... Video game characters getting shot in cutscenes and making a huge deal about it, even though they get shot in gameplay and just walk away fine. It's now official. I mean, I'm pretty sure we've all experimented with these thoughts beforehand. Yeah. But now you can experiment with those thoughts in the, the safe mental reassurance that the developers did themselves. That they also played around with those thoughts and tried to explain what's going on in game logic with... Regular logic. Huh. I, I, I kind of like that. I mean... That. I kind of like that, yeah. It, it makes sense, you know? It's a video game. Like, me and George were talking about this a little bit. Like, video games are built to be fun, even if they're meant to be hard or immersive or whatever. Uh, but if you... Because the Mega Swing is like, you lose player control. So when you lose player control, the player is completely in your hands as a designer. And it's like, well, fair enough. The, the player can choose when to swing. And swinging might be a good idea at better times than others. Like, you, you know, you've got less chance of dying. But if you're swinging and you have no control to either fight back or shoot or get into a cover and you're just like a sitting duck and you're, you're a target for the enemies, you can't have it. So enemies are just killing you. 50% of the time when you're swinging over, it's just not fun. Like, no one would enjoy that. So, games have these weird little tricks where they will yeah. make it a little easier for this... you. Or they will make it seem like you got away with it, which makes you feel even better. There was a great thread uh, on Twitter a couple of months ago about little game design tricks. I think PC Gamer then made an article about it. Like, yes. about little game tricks about game designers and what they employ to, that players don't know about that make them feel good. And so many games have like, when you're about to die and you're on the last hit, you get like a boost of health that you don't know about that makes it feel like, like you got out of a fight super lucky. Like, you, like you breezed by by the skin of your teeth and it's because you have this like secret health boost and stuff like Enemies that. Enemies like, in Bioshock always miss their first shot. Yeah, you know, to heighten the tension, like you're being <laughs> shot at, but you don't get hit. It makes you, like, 
immediately react and start to, either, to like, be fighting fair, back or looking for cover. This story is a little bit of a mix of that, plus like a weird headcanon aspect to it that isn't quite the same thing. It's more like acknowledging that enemy that bullet damage is not accumulating during those mega swing animations, even though it might look like it, while at the same time acknowledging that <laughs> Nathan Drake just getting lucky has been his health meter in their head cannon throughout this whole time. <laughs> yeah, which which is like, I guess they yeah. don't want to throw that in a tutorial message and ruin the player's immersion. But I mean, speaking of which, guys, I just don't know anymore. I just don't know if I can play a video game and see my character get shot and deal with it after this. I don't know if I can do it. It doesn't. It doesn't fix when uh, <laughs> fix when Nathan Drake shoots people and you know in the face and they die. And they don't. They don't die though. They, yeah, Nathan Drake is far luckier than they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a that. This actually adds a very dark, kind of omnipotent aspect to the universe that might even become like comedic in a weird way. Like Nathan Drake is just bumbling and stumbling his way through these <laughs> patterns of bullets and he's just getting lucky from it. He's just like cartwheeling through machine gun fire accidentally and all the enemies <laughs> don't don't get that luck. Ooh, that's that's funny. He becomes he becomes yeah. sentient. He becomes sentient, and he's he's just like holding onto a piece of rope, and he's like, "I'm swinging, guys. You can't hit me. He I'm swinging." Nathan Drake, <laughs> can't oh touch my God. me. D Jonathan Cooper, I'm sorry. You just turned Nathan Drake into the Jar Jar Binks of his own universe. <laughs> Nathan Drake is actually a secret Sith Lord who just pretends to be a charming stumbly bumbly fuck <laughs> when really stumbling out of danger is his superpower mm. accidentally fumbling out of the way of all those bullets is him predicting the future and just instinctively Jedi mind tricking around out of danger Wow. With with like half interpreted visions of the future that his instincts take over from and bumble him out. Yeah, I can head cannon too. <laughs> you're you're there. I'm sorry. Like like I said. Are you okay? Are you, this are you okay? Changes now, everything. <laughs> oh my god. We have been watching Nathan Drake trip over near misses. I know that in the game it might look like he gets hit by bullets, but you got to do this in video games. You got to use your imagination to to uh, fill the lines in between the math and the, the tokens and the moves that you're making. Because, you know, when you're like marching in one caveman to slap one wolf in civilization, that's like really an army down there. This is the same deal happens in like Fire Emblem and Advanced Wars. And, and now with with the Uncharted games, despite their, their high detail, highfalutin, high tech graphics engines, there's really implications happening in the video game play that you're engaging in. And the implication is that Nathan Drake is just bumbling and fumbling and stumbling and tripping and getting hilariously comedically divinely lucky if you ever review uh, another uncharted you're gonna you're gonna put a joke like a little gag with music it's you, not a joke music when he's like fumbling it's around he's just gonna make like glass noises and everything like clown you're a clown right <laughs> there's like a spring sound a window Burn? smashing and a cat screeching <laughs> <laughs> yep yep well there you well, go there you go. <laughs> Uncharted has forever been ruined. We were meant to quickly talk about that. What happened? We were going to quickly talk about it and then move on to questions, which we might as well. You know, I feel like we've 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 exhausted ourselves and the content of those stories. So let's move on to Gustavo TC, who showed up in our mailbag at dadandsonspodcast.gmail.com. Amongst, which like sneakily <laughs> snuck in amongst the hundreds of dad yeah, dads. Of wait, let's had, dig into the mailbag here. We're going to be doing dad dads. <laughs> mm. All, All right. Way. Uh, we got we got mail. a shitload of dad din. We're gonna be getting back to it next week, but this week we're doing mail, and we have just three. 
since since the dad din submissions happened. Well, we're going to try to roll through them faster and more voluminous next time. But for now, Gustavo TC asks, when did video game trailers get good? I know there's a shit, a lot of shit ones out there right now still, but I mean in general, compared to films from the 70s, for example, some trailers were spectacular and memorable, even better than today's. But with games, if you go back to E3 2001 or around that time, you see that there seems to be no structure or focus as to what's being presented in the trailer. I'm... Gustavo TC clarifies that he's younger than us all. He still has not achieved dad status, but even putting himself in the mind of a kid at the time, I can no. only imagine being confused rather than exciting for most of those old game trailers. And when did they get good? And perhaps is a more individual question for each of us. What's your favorite video game trailer of all time and why? Okay, so we got two prongs well, here. Well, I guess the answer... I, I think the answer is, like, video games started to become a lot more yes, like movies. they started hiring point. movie like, people is my... Like, theory yes we made started making games that were more meant to represent not represent resemble mm -hmm. or be like movies and which results you know we started getting tv time and like cinematographers and directors getting hired on to make trailers yes. which results in tra yeah. and not getting hired to make on trailers getting hired to make cutscenes, which results in a lot of angles and shots that make for great trailers which has steadily resulted in hiring yes. people who do video editing for the entertainment industry to do the trailers which yeah. was not a thing. And they hired people specifically earlier. to do the trailers. Yeah, I want to say... Yeah. Whereas back in the day, it would be people in internally in the studio just chopping together I some gameplay say footage, not not. This happened around the turn of the seventh console generation, HD graphics, facial animation becoming a really big deal. That's when you started seeing cinematic trailers that had uh, pre-rendered gameplay starting to look like normal gameplay. With like Call of Duty 2, for example, the E3 gameplay trailers were still like gunk of like weird techno music playing in between like blurry, highly compressed shots of video game footage that say things like, will you fight like a girl as the Conan theme plays in the background? Round of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Now you have like <laughs> boom, boom, an ancient evil arises. Boom, boom. When yeah, I think Gustavo's totally on something. It used to be like techno music with text and no narration. Um, and I want to say that that switch to HD graphics, getting character facial animation to matter, is when the big hiring pull from and outsourcing pull to the entertainment industry crossed a lot of cinematic techniques over to trickle them down into video game trailers and make video game trailers good through the around the turn of the the seventh console generation land out like standout trailers like i remember that original skyrim reveal really well yeah that was really good like the wall and it was like, and then it dun, phases dun. over to the villages where like people dun, are chopping dun. woods and windmills are spinning and and then it goes First person <laughs> like dragon trailer, fight with like no HUD on the screen and these really slow detailed animations. Do you speaking like do you remember the Mass Effect three first yeah. trailer? Yeah, no, no, the Mass Effect two trailer that the had that the game. two steps from hell music, which is a Hollywood production stock music track, was made for a really great ME two trailer on launch too. Yeah. I remember, the, I remember the Mass Effect Three one really standing out. Like it was at the, was it the Game Awards then? What was Jeff Keighley's the Spike TV. award show before? Yeah, the Spike TV one. Yeah, it was like shown that, and it was like a dude in like Big Ben in London, and it was like they're coming for us. <laughs> and then it had that really somber piano, and then all of a sudden you oh. had the fucking Reapers, and then the trailer fades out with the uh, the Halo Three like, museum Whoa. trailers. Like that was a big collaborative effort with Hollywood uh, effects the artists and miniature Gears designers. Yeah, yeah. That was if really if good. if you like the trailer, there's probably a big deal of Hollywood collaboration, if not Hollywood influence, which means that Hideo mm. Kojima's trailers knock them out of the fucking park these days the 2013 e3 trailer whoa for mgs5 i think might actually be my favorite of all time nice good, good ass trailer, trailer. What about you, Matt? Um, yeah i sorry i was doing a little research um uh yeah Me too. As, as you're doing <laughs> these questions um yeah i i think the mo when i was actually re-watching trailers because I, I don't do that anymore um but i used to when i was younger back in the day around the era of like halo 3 
And I think my favorite that I've actually rewatched multiple times was Gears of War 2, the last day trailer. And you, you hear like how it ends playing the background. Oh, yeah. And it's like synced with the music. And I love, as you can see with my videos, I love when music is synced with the video. And it's just, I watch it multiple times and it always gives me like chills. This just because uh, there was this atmosphere about Gears of War that I don't know. I really loved and, that game and back in the day. Gears of War like has its own little history of famous trailers because like back then I think it was E3 2005 was the Destroyed Beauty trailer for Gears of War One. Yeah, which would have been right around then the turn of the sixth console generation that uh, impressed everyone by by actually cutting your video game trailer to the music. Yeah. <laughs> like, like there was just basic oh shit that video game developers did not know about editing, really basic stuff that <laughs> didn't happen until until the seventh gen. It's 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 oh, I, I love those trailers. They're all they're all pretty good. One and two. Yeah. Mad World. It got me into that. I never heard nice. of Mad World until Mad I heard World. the yeah. Gears of One trailer all all around me yeah are, uh, <laughs> familiar faces <laughs> yeah it's 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 very sad and good ass, for there, there, there's a lot of good ass trailers um but i but, but? And i don't know why but it had such an effect on me and i thought it was such a beautifully constructed trailer and highlighted almost exactly what you were going to do in the game but maybe maybe overemphasize just how much story you would have in the game, and then you played the game, and there was very little story at all. And that was the uh, yes, the the <laughs> no the the Breath oh, of the Wild yeah. 2017 yeah, trailer, was fantastic. like that three minute build up of where it starts out like with <laughs> the sweeping landscapes with the them. amazing. <laughs> Like I can talk so much the shit amazing about these games, but I'm right here being like, yeah, those trailers were so good. Like, Matt, I'm do you remember? It now. We I know, rushed right? about I, it on I, the I, DOE like, cast. It's so wow, good. Wow, this is like, nothing. I like remember, the and game. the bit was. <laughs> oh my god, seagulls! <laughs> yeah. No, like the landscape stuff, like really shows off. Like, I remember thinking, wow, that's a lot of different environments. I didn't picture the scale until I saw this trailer and then like hiding the master sword in the middle but then it goes into the story stuff and you think ah there's gonna be a lot of story but oh my god like the bit where Zelda cries and shit like that oh it's mm -hmm. so good uh such a good okay, trailer well that's that's all three of us right yeah uh we got another oh, question from Alexander E packed. Oh, this trailer is so yeah, good. Got switch modes. Yep, yep. Flat, it. Flush all those thoughts out. Get ready for a new train of thought. Alexander E asks, Could "What's your opinion on the GameCube exclusive Metal Gear Solid <laughs> Twin Snakes?" Wait, what? How does it compare to the original? Oh my god! What? Wait, wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Did you erase your name from this email? Because I don't see a name on it, but I'm pretty sure there was like, <laughs> "Hey, George, I was just wondering, what's your opinion on the GameCube exclusive?" <laughs> I, I do not believe Alexander E. specifically directed this question to me, but we can all pick up on the implication. <laughs> yeah, the Twin Snakes! It's, uh... It's alright. Not as good as the original. Fun but fact! it's okay. Fun, it's the first version of Metal Gear I played. Uh, I... <laughs> and then I went back and played the PlayStation. I played stuff. half... Right. I I played half of the yeah it's a it's a uh, Silicon Knights game one of Too one human. of the three I believe yeah it is isn't it yeah. I and, and that. believe it or not the only one that seems to have just kind of come and gone to to schedule to budget without a lot of ho hum nor fanfare on the way in or out of its existence I think Eternal Darkness was in development for fucking ever Too Human was in development for fucking ever but they cranked out the Twin Snakes like they they didn't miss their deadlines if I remember correctly on that I don't remember a lot of controversies following that game I know for a fact with Twin Snakes Kojima changed so much because 
He hated the English script. Yeah, for the Jeremy first game. Blostein and Kojima did not get along after it shipped, but they apparently got along just well when they were making it together. Uh, there's a little more to do with the fact that it was the 90s and they couldn't communicate <laughs> very well. So Jeremy just did what he wanted. <laughs> yeah, m- maybe, but I, I think. I, I, that's why that's why Kojima didn't no, like it so much because I, I, the, the, my Jeremy theory changed a lot is that it was the 90s and stakes what? were lower because what didn't are these really stupid video game bullshits English? no one cares about and that the, the, exactly in the 90s you didn't really know how much and of an effect yeah they didn't know MGS like, would be a big series so I have a feeling that's why Kojima yeah. didn't care so much not necessarily because of the translation issues because there's a lot of interview material from Blostein himself talking about how he was actually closer to Kojima for that game than many of the English translators were later uh, the woman who did two oh, got yeah, like that, a binder yeah. in the mail from and some emails with Kojima's staff, whereas Blostein, I believe, got a binder from Kojima himself and was able to have a couple of meetings with him and a direct line of communication. Yeah, with Kojima him. wasn't the star back then. That's why he was he was just making shit. Well, he Konami also and, wanted a more literal you know, translation notes. for the sequels. Blostein got free reign that the other sequel translators did not. Yeah, because they after the first one, and that's why they changed so yeah. much with Twin Snakes. Like Jeremy put a lot of his own personality and stuff like that into the first game, and which is weird because a lot of like the stuff that we quote about Metal Gear was not written by Kojima and was not in the game at all in the in the Japanese version. Like a lot of the stuff we think about Metal Gear, like. You like playing Castlevania. I'm gonna draw a line or, with a bullet to your heart. Yeah, like stupid, like the stupid stuff we remember that is really quotable is all like what Whereas Jeremy the wrote. Stuff and then just he gets stupid. All, <laughs> it's, it's just stupid. It's Kojima, <laughs> and it's like that. Like got a lot of praise. Jeremy got a lot of Kojima praise. Kojima got of a lot of praise and for like, Jeremy's stuff. Woo. Yeah, but then Kojima was like, "Well, I didn't write that. Next time, we're gonna make sure that everything that gets translated is is mine." <laughs> Is like is almost direct of mine, and that's why so, I don't recommend unique. the Twin Snakes over the. Even though it's still fun, I think it's still worth a play. If you want to make play a more pure Kojima-driven version, play Twin Snakes. Although the first person mode it thing kills is kills right? the boss fights, though it's it's fun to play around with as like a novelty. Yeah. But the game they did they should have remade the boss fights for that first person aiming, and they didn't. Uh, play just play the all, all of which I version. think are fairly like common consensus comments, except for maybe how hard we're being on Kojima here. Because the more the more you read into it behind <laughs> the scenes of how Metal Gear games get translated, the less good it looks on Kojima. And the Twin Snakes, I think, was like the first major yeah. example of people noticing that, huh? Even though it's the same game and supposed to be the same script, there seems like there's a little less life here. It seems like the voice actors are a little less enthusiastic. I, I wonder what's going on. Uh, Matt, do you, do you have any comments? Nope, not. (laughs) (laughs) All right, moving on. Jordan W. asks, hey guys, I'm a huge Metal Gear fan. Wait, George W.? Jordan W., not George Den W. Uh. I thought it was George W. Weedman. <laughs> Jordan W. asks, hey guys, I'm a huge Metal Gear fan and was wondering what you guys think the odds are of Konami releasing an updated collection for current consoles and PC. You know what, Jordan? I want to, like, channel some some Last Jedi here and be like, at least, at least we can hold on to a spark of hope. And that's all that matters. I mean, a Metal Gear Solid HD collection on PC would just be, for me, the end point of the series. Because at that point, you have PC ports of 1 to 5 that are competent. You can't buy a PC port of 1 these days legally, but you can find it out there. And it will run better on modern operating systems, better than the fucking Sims will. Wow. And if they put out... They previously made a port of MGS2 that was a lot worse than the first game on PC. No clue if they'll ever try reselling that one. But I think it is more likely for them to resell a PC port of the HD collection because they recently ported the HD collection over to NVIDIA Shield, which is kind of sort of more of an Android mobile sort of architecture, but still means that they are officially supporting this IP. They put out a remaster of Zoe 2 for PlayStation VR, no less. 
So they are digging up old Kojima franchises and still putting, making their their quick cash drops with it. And I actually am more optimistic about the possibility of this than I was in 2015 right now. Because sometimes you see stuff just pop up on PC these days. Yakuza! The, a lot, I don't know if I want to say the majority, but a lot of the Yakuza franchise just suddenly appeared this year on PC on Steam. And I have a feeling that that's uh, a story we've seen of the past generation, console generation, as Japanese developers waking up to just how much of an audience there is on PC, because it's not something they're used to. PC gaming's not popular in Japan. It really is everywhere else in the world, including other Asian countries. Um, and the PC sales also don't follow that like typical first two weeks splash of, of you having to make back all your development costs as soon as the launch happens. It's more of a slow burn, long term thing, still viable. Uh, it doesn't really follow the Japanese method, but they are picking up on it, and it's been really cool to see. It's been really cool to see uh, translation houses like uh, 8.4 pop up, like Dangan uh, pop up. A lot of the work our, our friend Nayan Ramachandran does uh, has re- directly plugged into this part of the Japanese game industry that's rejuvenized their presence yeah. on PC. And I, all of the above reasons are why I am more optimistic, though there is nothing official. I just think the environment is there. The market is better suited for it. And Konami themselves seems to have wisened up for it since 2015. Boom. Ah, <sighs> Konami. That was a mouthful, I realized. I'm kind of out of breath. You've... You... <laughs> what else Liam, you like should know this stuff too, because you're you're plugged into that world. You know a lot of expats who do work with the Japanese game industry to outsource and export their uh, stuff for the rest of us. We're seeing a we lot are. more of it. Like, yeah, that's true. You, and I it mean, is because you of your it. friends like, you know, in a got... like weird economically at large yeah, scale economic in a weird way. way. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, Dungan, those guys are doing really cool stuff where they're just basically taking games that in the West wouldn't get released in Japan and then they're releasing it here in Japan and seeing how it does, you know, like Iconoclasts, they, they publish that over here. They're publishing like Pocket Rumble, which came out on Switch this week. Like they're publishing it in Japan. They're publishing games that traditionally wouldn't get released in Japan. So Japanese gamers can play Western games. But on the flip side, they're also publishing Japanese games into the West as well. And, you know, we're seeing stuff that they're doing. And then, you know, you've got places like 8.4, but 8.4 do... 8.4 do bigger work. No, I don't want to say bigger work. I mean, 8.4 do, Near. like, they do jobs yeah. for Nintendo. They do Nier. The, the superstar like, stuff. The, like, yeah, like, Roy, who's a really, really good friend of mine. I love Roy to death. He was, like, the project manager for Xenoblade Chronicles X. Like, the 8.4, 8th floor? 8.4 are trusted by Nintendo. You know, they're really close with, like, Bill Trennan and some guys at Nintendo. They do amazing work on the Fire Emblem series. Like, those guys have got their shit, like, down. And... Like, if you're interested in reading about them, if you don't know about A4, they also do a podcast. Ooh. Like, there was a Guardian article. Like, a Guardian, like, the, the fucking, one of the, the most respected newspaper outlets in the UK. Like, the Guardian wrote an article about A4 and the work they do in Japan. And uh, John Ricciardi, uh, goes, who uh, co-founded A4, go into great detail about, like, the work they do, how, you know, it started, and uh, the sort of... The importance of localization. Like, there's something John says that, you know, he said to me, like, multiple times. It's like, people only notice localization when it's bad. And I also want to point out, like, like, another factor to this. In addition to there being, A, a big demand for PC ports, because, B, PC gaming is really popular everywhere in the world except Japan and the States in a weird way. Um, And C, there being this big cottage industry of expats living in Japan who will plead personally in the faces of Japanese developers who don't know this stuff as well as them to make ports. Yeah, like, your game's great. Like, put it put it on the PC. They, like, they really, like, a lot do of times don't know. And you, like, realize it when walking around with Japan. I was... The, like, the Tales series is, like, I think one of the best examples. Like, the Tales series, you know, does pretty okay on, like, consoles in the West. Like, you know, it's, it's still stuck around, but like on PC, those games sold like in the hundreds of thousands on Steam. But, like but in that in first addition, couple of weeks. In addition, like, you have the shared x86 architecture, which means that if Konami decides they want to make an HD collection of Metal Gear Solid for PS4 
as they dug up their old PS2 game of Zone of the Enders 2 and made an HD remaster of it for PS4, if they make an H- if they dig up the old versions of Metal Gear Solid and make an HD remaster for their consoles, which they are used to making stuff for, that they know they'll make money for, they have a build that is not necessarily ready for the PC, but will at least not take as much work <clears throat> in generations past to port over to PC as it would this time. I mean, stuff always takes work, but yeah, it's like we live in a world now where people make stuff on all the same similar they have engines similar that all have the same now. similar architecture. Yes, and it's like, you know, it's if you're making a game in Unity, you can release it on PlayStation 4, Switch, Xbox One, VR and PC platforms, and, too. Yeah, exactly. It's like Japanese developers are slowly moving away from in-house engines to Unreal. And, you know, like, for example, Octopath Traveler is made, like, in the Unreal Engine. So, you know, when you've got, like, Square Enix, like, making, like, fully-fledged Japanese RPGs in, like, Unreal and Western engines that can be ported to a lot of platforms, it's like, well, anyone can do And anything. I think I want to, yeah. like, point out, don't <laughs> underestimate the importance of, like, culture and environment. Because I, I saw some comments... In a, in a Reddit thread about localizing that was just like bewildered that Japan hadn't jumped on this bandwagon sooner and that they don't jump on this bandwagon more often in terms of making PC ports for the rest of the world. But you really don't see PC gaming most of the place in Japan. In Akihabara, there's a few, a lot of build your own PC stores, but elsewhere, like their world is not accommodating to that like it's there's they've got space concerns and environmental concerns and power consumption concerns that that make yeah. it something that literally would not pop up in the back of a mind of a Jack- japanese executive who themselves would love to know more about pc gaming and how to make money with it well you've also got to remember like until maybe i don't know i, I it's always it's always been around in something but uh, until like four or five years ago pc gaming in japan was just like not a thing like it's only recently that there Which has been a change. And you notice to it too, change because yeah, like in Akihabara, like in Aki, you see PC stores now. Like you see Razer has like a pop up shop in Akihabara. Like you you see the changes now. Whereas before there was just like none of that. There was no like PC game stores. There was no buying the pro Razer keyboard and Razer mouse also, and stuff like that. Also, physical media PC gaming is still wasn't a the thing. normal way to buy games in Japan, and digital media is the normal way yeah. to buy games on a PC <laughs> gamer rig from Azes. Yeah, that's true. But that's the you know. The Japanese are kind of slow to adopt these things, and they historically slow always have. But you know they'll get there, and then we'll quality. see. Most most of the Japanese releases in the future will be on PC as well. You know, we got Monster Hunter we got coming in August. Bayonetta. That's like a, I feel like once Bayonetta and yeah, Vanquish Bay- made the switch, Vanquish. Like that, that affirmed that the trend yeah. exists. Like that means it's a real thing. And I'm pretty sure it was because of like, English those... speakers arguing in the faces of Platinum developers about the importance of of this thing and how much money they could be making from from it. Yeah, I'll honestly say I I truly think like with games like Final Fantasy 15 and Monster Hunter World, like big AAA Japanese studio games, like they're only on PC because of the West, like. They're not there because Japan wants them or there's a market for it in Japan. They're, I think they're specifically there because there are so many PC gamers or so many people who played those games on consoles back in the day who now have progressed to playing games on PC. And that's where they want to play it because that's where they get the best looking games, the best running games, you know? So it, it, it'll change. Slowly, if if also the, the niche and retains it is their because, interest. Because PC gaming, I feel is on its way out in a generational way. If you go to a store... But that's the thing, it's not really niche. Like, it, like people buy crap on the Steam yeah, sales. But like, they buy you crap, can't right? go to a store Some random and buy dude a who's never like seen it. used to be able to. No, but, it, but if so many people in the West already have these PCs anyway, like, you've been... You built a custom-built PC and you've played The Sims it's and Morrowind. It's not mainstream, like, You're though. the exact type. No, but the point is, like... People just buy games on 
Steam. I just, they just buy wonder them. if they Why will in they 10 play years them after. Because like, <laughs> the Switch has had so much success that I imagine that the future generations of consoles are going to try to converge handheld formats. And PCs have been phased out of brick-and-mortar retail to the point where the kids more grow up with laptops and tablets, is, is what I'm getting at. And I think that when the people of our generation and, and of the next, like kids these days who are building gaming PCs, when they get old and lose interest, I wonder if there'll be a generation b- below them who still will have grown up with PC gaming and will be buying these things in like the 2030s. I don't know. As long as like MOBAs and... MOBAs might do it. MMOs I mean, it might still, still be a big thing mass- in Asia, actually, and popular. not in the West in the future. We'll see. That's a weird... That's a hot take I don't want to put on Twitter, but I would not be surprised if PC gaming becomes yeah. more of an Asian thing <laughs> than a Western thing because of... Uh, <laughs> you mean like a more Ch- Korean, Korean and Chinese China, thing? Yeah. <laughs> like, because MOBAs are popular in Japan on phones. <laughs> like, PUBG is super popular in Japan... It's just not PUBG. It's called Knives Out, and it's on mobile phones, and it's a PUBG clone, and it's got like three million players. Japan is just weird. Game is gonna be Japan is weird, man. Clear it out. I mean, I guess I have a different perspective because I. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm just there. more I'm like in the middle shitty. of it. You know, I see young kids come in all the time building their stuff because they want to stream. Oh yeah, or they want to. That's the Willy oh, Wonka. The- and, and the marketing for PC hardware is so much more geared towards, like, gaming as a profession now. Yeah. And that wasn't... Yeah, and, like, exactly, building, right? Buying a computer is... You get blasted with so much more of that than you used to. A lot of people come in just to, because they want to play Fortnite. They want to play Fortnite. <laughs> they want to play PUBG. Whatever is new, uh, Overwatch, I hear that a lot. And then that's funny. You have that dynamic wasn't there in. when I was growing up. Yeah, I, like there were no PC system sellers. There were no killer apps that kids would buy PCs for. <laughs> I mean, and like it was just the like the promise of a better now. experience. I would say it's way PC game is way bigger than it was before. Like we didn't have Fortnite back in the day, and that's or weird because Legends. if you go to a Best Buy or a Walmart or a Target, there's no not a PC section. Well, there well there's there's the barely a PC now. section at Best Buy. Well, I guess what you, there's a PC section at Best Buy now. Uh, yeah, I, I I was at Best Buy. The PC section, I did not see PCs. I saw PC accessories. I was at Target searching for PC accessories and couldn't find any. I wanted. I wanted a surge protector and an ergonomic like keyboard wrist rest. They did not have the wrist rest. They did have the surge protectors. Yeah, but keyboards know. and like mouse pads are just not there. Printers. Uh, I, I, yeah, Target is definitely different. Best Buy will have some stuff if it's by a competitor, which the one that's by me is by a competitor. That's why... That's why they stock some stuff. So I'd be interested in actually knowing, because that's all anecdotal. Like, like my assumption of PC gaming going away is me just seeing what brick and mortar look like when I'm there. I wonder what the actual statistics are, because maybe there is a larger market of people ordering gaming PCs than there used to be of the size of market of mainstream people buying regular, like, home office PCs so all in I, years past. I mean, all I could do is offer, like... What I see, I don't know if this mm-hmm. is like the, the grand thing, but people would come in um, because you can't really, as you say, you can't really go in and just get a PC. So they go into a, a store, like a, a tech store, um, like the one I work at, and they're able to just kind of pick out parts. And they say, oh, man, this is much easier than going on, on Newegg because most of the time, most people are just ordering from Newegg all the time. You're guilty as charged. I mean, you know, I went like half and half with this one. Um, and and that's and that's kind of what it is, and and that's why like, in order for because the retail is like dying, dying hard, yeah. um, which is sad to watch. In order to stay alive, people Ugh. have to do like amazing customer service, or uh, and offer the deals, the people, the things that get them into the door. You know, kind of like what the um, job market, you know, like, um, for instance, like Micro Center will sell processors um, at like a low cost, like a hundred dollars cheaper than everyone else. Uh, just to get people through the door so they can build a PC with them 
instead of building it at Newegg or Amazon or whatever like that. So, so the parts will be cheaper, but there's still some way they got to make the difference somehow. Yeah. And that's with the, the checkout line. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's his business. But like, yeah. When, that's, when that's, you that's... throw your USB disc in the, in the grocery cart, yeah. it's like <laughs> $20 more than it should be. But that's because your processor was $100 less than it should be. Yeah. You know, they have to make up from selling at cost. Um, yeah. But yeah. 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 Um, but it's not that big that there should be all types of tech stores like that with PCs and stuff like that. It all depends on the area. Yeah. But yeah. Because the general like neighborhood electronics store no longer has computer stuff. And that has me afraid for the future of PC gaming. I mean, if the cloud thing actually picks up, that might be tight. If it, that's still different. That's not like a PC that you go to the store and buy, and your whole Steam library yeah, suddenly would, would be like have to be compatible. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would completely still like change things to a point where it would. Le- I yeah, I am scared for exactly that. Yeah, the cloud gaming goes crazy, and you know that, everyone that has that is fiber, why I am scared. You know, Ten years from now, and oh man, we should we should go. We should go. <laughs> Although it's hard to podcast now. <laughs> Yeah, because cause we've been going on for too long, and you guys got work and shit. Yeah. And floods. Yeah, I got to go to work now. <laughs> Actually. Shit, we talked about floods, we didn't we? Oh, my God, that was for an age. Over two hours. Wow, is this the longest dad and son We have to pull record? ourselves away from each other. <laughs> like, like, stop making out with one another in the middle of public. <laughs> and and move on with with our lives because you guys got important shit to do and I hope I do. <laughs> yeah, <geez. laughs> Playing The Sims Two yeah, does I'm not. I'm writing count, a follow up video on my Project W and I hope I can get it out before the weekend's over. Hey, that was Dad and Sons. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Good luck with your video, George. Or George, as you would say in your near Otanta video, gun bate. Do your best, but don't. Self-destruct in the process. Uh, Nice pronunciation. Get your death and pictures in points week. Or else.